Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. My name is Alex Shoemate, number 1210. I'm the current club president, filling in for now our revolving door of interviewers. Um, as you can imagine, with an Adventures Club, we have lots of people coming and going. And so the distinct honor of interviewing tonight's guest has fallen upon me. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to our member, Wayne White, who's going to tell us a little bit tonight about his many adventures in the South Pole and maybe some of his, his adventures before sure. that. Yeah, go into that. Um, and what brought him to be a member yeah. of this prestigious club and some of his record-setting uh, achievements down south. So, Wayne, Fantastic. take it away. Okay. You know, folks, I just want to say it's really an honor to be here tonight. It really is. Um, and uh, I want to start with a story. Uh, it's, a number of our members have been uh, interviewed for this whiskey at a map thing that Michael Reinhardt puts on. And... Um, Raise your hand if you've been there. We got several people that have done that. I thought that was really cool. It's a podcast, a podcast thing. Now, what the hell is a podcast? I guess you listen to it or something later, right? So, um, you, know, you know, it's not visual. You listen to this thing. So he, uh, he contacted me and he said, well, we're going to start off with this whiskey. The map con you know, concept is you have a, a drink and then you have a map and then you launch an expedition from there. He says, think of a drinking story. I want you to think of a drinking story. Uh, um, to get it started, kind of an icebreaker sort of a thing, as he would call it, icebreaker. And um, I quickly had something. And um, then he, he notified me right before the uh, podcast and said, we don't need that. Your stuff is, we want to do other things. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll mention Shackleton Whiskey, and I will, uh, and I will um, then also we'll go into this death in the Amazon thing that he was much more interested in. So we did that. But I had a story. And what I didn't tell him, and icebreaker, you know, as it was supposed to be, was, uh, well, I live in Rockport, Texas, a little place on the ocean, which I'll show you some photos of later. I was invited to a, some time ago, I was invited to a friend's house, my next door neighbor. Uh, he's from Taiwan, national, national you know, China, Taiwan, um, immigrated, and uh, he invited me over for drinks. So I went over to his house. And uh, when I got there, he had a bunch of his Taiwanese friends. It was all Taiwanese from Taiwan. This was the, the real deal, no shit. You know, these guys had come over from China. And some of them had been in the U.S. for a while, but um, they, were, uh, they were from China, and it was a fascinating experience. Uh, after a lot of drinks, uh, someone had the good sense to bring out some food. We had some really great noodles, <clears throat> and then this kind of white meat, but I didn't really know what it was. And I ate it, and I asked one of the Chinese, the Taiwanese at some point, you know, what was that? And he spoke in Chinese, and he, uh, he uh, said some things, and another guy looked at him, and I thought, you know, I get the impression he doesn't really want me to know what it was, and it's probably for the best. <laughs> so what I did was, I just ate it all politely, but didn't ask for any more. Then we drank and drank, and then one of the guys had a guitar, and they were singing songs. And I found out with enough scotch, I can sing Chinese. <laughs> So uh, we did that for a while, and the evening progressed, and God knows all the stuff that happened. And uh, incredible evening with these guys. And uh, next thing you know, next morning, you know, I came to, I don't say I woke up. I'd like to say I woke up. But it was more like coming out of like this coma thing. I'm, I'm in my guest house. I'm still wearing my clothes from the night before. <laughs> my boots were off. That was good. Somehow that had happened. And um, I got a couple cats on me. Got a lot of cats, and that's important in this story. Cats are on me. I'm in the guest house, in bed in my clothes, and I'm thinking back to the evening how much fun I had with these guys. The Taiwanese were a lot of fun, from what I remember. And uh, I thought back to the food, and I thought back to this. Noodles were great, and I thought about that white meat. And I thought, ah, oh, shit. See, I got a lot of cats, and my cats are all over the yard, and they're in his yard and stuff, too. And I know, these guys, you know, I know what they do. So I thought, ah, oh, shit. So I run outside, and I start counting all my cats to make sure I got all of them, OK? Thinking, you know, when I count them, here's, you know, here's, here's all my cats. Here's Colton, here's, you know, Mary, here's all, you know, my cats. And I finally get the right numbers. Like, oh, God, okay, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Got them all. We didn't need them. I then go back into the old house, and um, my lovely wife is probably avoiding me at that point in time. But I get in my green room in there, which I'll show you some photos of because it fits into tonight's discussion a little bit. And on a chair, my leather chair is my Webley service revolver. It's an old 455 service revolver. Brakes, action's broken. It's missing a round. I thought, oh shit, what now? So I run over and start counting all the Taiwanese. 
all present and accounted for, all present and accounted for, which I was really happy. And then, you know, the evening then, you know, it was really a good evening, successful evening, I'd call it, because I had other evenings that maybe weren't quite as fun as that, but, you know, maybe ended a little not as good. And my lovely wife has aided and abetted in those things and made them a lot worse sometimes, quite frankly. <laughs> so anyway, um, I didn't tell that story I, because he wanted me to do these other things. And uh, I thought about it later, and it kind of disturbed me because I thought, thought, you know, he asked me to do this. I had it ready in this. And, but he probably wants some epic drinking story. But, but that was just Saturday night, the previous Saturday night. So, you know, welcome to my life, folks. <laughs> All right, so here we go. So um, where do you go from there? So let's talk about the South Pole. That's why we're here tonight, right? The only thing is I need to see these slides. How the hell am I going to do you can that? See them down. Oh, yeah, down yeah. Funny. Okay, I can see. Um, wow, technology. This is different. Last time I was here was a little different. They, they, you guys have really done a great job with the electronics and all. So uh, uh, let's go ahead and we, here's what we're going to do first, folks. It's a short video. And, and before we start, let me explain what this is. When I was at the South Pole last year, the the, the 2020 year that I was here, 2020 season, winter season, um, the Explorers Club had a thing called Minute at the Mic. Minute at the Mic, Minute at the Mic, which they wanted Explorers Club members to check in and to tell them what they were doing during the pandemic. So I did this Minute at the Mic. So go ahead, Andy, and do that first one. Greetings from the South Pole. I'm Wayne Wright, the Texas chapter. Scott South Pole Station here on my third winter. What am I doing here? Well, I'm the captain of a ship, a ship that moves at 33 feet per year across the ice. With that, quoting from a famous captain, the path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereon my soul is grooved to run. Over unsounded gorges, through the rifle hearts of mountains, under torrents beds, unerringly I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. South Pole Winter Crew 2020, The Iron Way. I hope this video finds you all well. Wow. All right. Yeah. That uh, shows you a little bit about the conditions. That day was about minus 80 something with a, a real stiff breeze. So the, the, uh, the wind chill was you know, much greater than probably at minus 100. Um, and uh, I got that in one take. It's because I understand that phrase. I understand that. That was, if anybody is familiar with Herman Melville, that's Ahab. That's an Ahab speech. That was my speech. That was something that I wanted to convey, and I conveyed to my crew. Um, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about leadership. Maybe we'll get into it. Sometimes when I talk, people are interested in it. Sometimes they're not as much. They want to see what the diesel generators look like. But it's all about leadership um, to me, and it's all about taking care of that crew. If you know anything about the character Ahab, he was certainly a flawed figure, but to me a beautiful figure. Ahab, a great ship's captain. Ahab was a great ship's captain. Ahab, a great orator who could talk, who is, and, and, who is able to uh, get his men to follow him and, and to, under a, into a terrible situation um, to kill this white whale. Uh, Ahab had his scars. See, everyone has scars, whether they can be seen or not. So I love the character of Ahab. But what I didn't love about that fictional character was the fact that as a captain, he forgot. And of course, it's written in. There's a reason. It's a cautionary tale. He forgot the most important thing, the most important thing with the captain in charge of his ship. And that is the care and the safety of his crew and then the care and the safety of that beautiful ship. He had the Pequod, and I had the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. So that, that little rant of Ahab's meant a lot to me, but it meant a lot to me to, to, with my own extreme passion and drive, and I'm on those goddamn iron rails, I can smell and taste those things, let me tell you. Uh, but to never forget that my crew and my ship was the most important thing. Okay, um, next thing, this next video was, the Explorers Club seemed to like that, and I can see why, it's, it's, you know, it sounds cool and all that. But I made the analogy with the ship and with the ice and all that. So I was contacted by the Explorers Club and they said, would you be part of World Ocean Week? And I, uh, um, because I'll explain why, how that South Pole fits into World Ocean Week. So I did a longer video for World Ocean Week, which I think you'll enjoy because it shows something about the station and what we do there. So Andy, let's go to number two. Greetings from the South Pole. I'm Wayne White, the winter manager at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. Folks, did you know Antarctica is actually classified as a desert? It's the highest, driest, coldest place on the planet. But make no mistake, I'm the captain of a ship. 
a ship that sits on nearly two miles of ice. This two miles of ice is moving. It's moving that way at around 33 feet per year. In thousands of years, this ice that I'm standing on will find its way to the sea and then into our beautiful southern oceans. That's why it's important that we monitor the health of this Antarctic ice cap, as it will have an effect on the health of our ocean and its levels. So what do we do here? First of all, we survive. We survive in one of the most inhospitable environments on the planet. The current air temperature is minus 80 something with a wind chill making it around minus 130. That doesn't keep us inside. Personally, over the last three winters I've been here, I've walked 3,500 miles outside and should hit my goal of 4,000 miles uh, by the time I leave in November. But what else do we do here? Most importantly, we do some very cool science. Let me show you a little bit of that. First, we have our ice cube laboratory. This is a neutrino telescope. Imagine a cubic kilometer of ice with over 5,400 embedded detectors. These detectors detect neutrinos coming in from nuclear forces in stars and black holes. Then we have the South Pole Telescope. This is a 10 meter microwave dish which detects the echo of the Big Bang and birth of the universe. Next, we have our MAPO. This hosts the bicep array, which also looks at cosmic microwave background and is looking for evidence of inflation right after the Big Bang. Then we have our Aero. This is a part of a global network that monitors gases in the Earth's atmosphere to track and model human impacts. For World Oceans Week, here at the South Pole, I'm Wayne White. Okay, um, that was actually shot by, that was a hell of a job, and if we have time, I'll show you something later that, that uh, shows how that really got made, but Danny Hampton, Danny Hampton was our steward. He did dishes, basically, for a year at the South Pole. Wash pots and pans, cleaned rooms. Uh, it was a very uh, um, non-glamorous job, and uh, he did it. And um, he turned into quite a photographer through the year, and, and uh, we, did it, we did that on an iPhone, actually. Uh, it's very rudimentary done. But um, I think it's a good job, and it kind of explains what's happening at the, what was happening at the South Pole. Um, I have one last video, and maybe the, another one if, when I'm done, if we have time. Uh, and this is an important video, because of the three years I did there, which I'll explain, 17, 19, and 20. Uh, this last year was quite challenging with the COVID virus, and I'll explain it in the program later. But as we, uh, as we uh, progressed through that year, it went from this, uh, we're you know, locked in this place with no way out, and uh, it went from this virus where we had no idea what was gonna happen to, was anyone you know, gonna be coming to pick us up at the end of the season? We didn't know how bad things were gonna get. So this next video was done at our sunrise dinner in September, where I am addressing the crew at the South Pole, the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station sunrise dinner, something you'll never see anywhere, but I had it videoed because I thought it was important. So let's go to video three, please. Apologies while we work through the technical difficulties. Um, for some, we're going to try re-importing that and getting that back up. But can you uh, tell us a little bit about it, Wayne? While yeah, we do sure that? thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank it's you. a it's a dinner video. It's taken right before our dinner, and I'm going to kind of show you some things about that. What we do. Uh, there's three major holidays that we have formal functions for at the South Pole. The uh, the uh, midwinter day, which is around June 21st. Um, uh, well, actually, the closing of the station, the midwinter, the midwinter day, and then uh, we will have. Well, actually, I should say the sunset, sunset dinner that occurs at sunset, then the midwinter dinner, and then the sunrise dinner. Uh, and the sunrise, uh, so you go from you know, darkness uh, into uh, uh, when the sun's coming back. Now, when the sun was coming back, that was when the 2020 crew was thinking about how we were going to get out of there and how we were going to go home. So um, I wanted to make a special point of talking to the guys and. Uh, um, giving them my thoughts on what we were facing, this new world that we were going to be arriving in. And if we can't do that, let's move on. That's okay. I don't we got want it, Wayne. We're, we're ready when you are. All right, let's go. Let's go. 
Sunrise dinner, that's it. All right, folks. All right, crew. Welcome to the 2020 South Pole Winter Over Sunrise Dinner. You guys happy to be here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, well, we're going to get to them. We're going to get to them. Where else would you want to be than here? Okay, folks, a couple of things. Um, you know, uh, the other day I had a couple of job interviews, phone interviews from here. And during those interviews, I invoked the names of the greats, Ernest Shackleton, Captain Scott, Roll Amundsen. When we came to discussing things about leadership, all great leaders in their own way. Now that may be a have been a tactical error, actually, because I don't know these days if those guys are still recognized as we do here. And while my name will never be mentioned with any of those people, um, I've done my best through this season to keep their, their memories alive. And I think by now, most of you have learned a few things about these men and the great deeds that they've done. Now, the other thing that these guys have in common, they're all immortal, right? They're all immortal. Well, you are too, to a point. This beautiful photo that we took this, this last week, it actually surprised me, folks. I thought we were going to go more for the Star Wars thing. And this goddamn thing, as far as I'm concerned, hit it out of the park. Yeah, way good. With the uh, new thing. With us, with us and the ice. And that's what this is about, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. With us and the ice, that's what it's all about. There's not a lot of other things, distractions in that photo. It's quite simple. And the 2020 South Pole Winter Over crew will be, will be noticed forever for that, I'm sure. Now, folks, you know the kind of season we've had. What we've done here has been spectacular. It's been fairly quiet. The work that you've done has uh, served to keep it that way. But off island, off ice, we have faced some real turmoil. The world we're in right now, when you look at what's going on with the virus, you look at what's going on with political strife, you look at certain things that have happened to crew members, deaths, divorces, hurricanes, fires, everything the goddamn locusts. Is that what's in the left? Locusts? Is that somewhere? I think so. Frogs. All right. But we face those things. We have faced those things together as a crew. And I have been damned impressed by how we have bonded, how we bonded through those things, how we've come together, and how we have, have bonded as a crew that we have. Bonded by those things, not let politics and such silly things like that affect us as crew. And then we bonded with something else, I think. We bonded with the ice. We stand on two miles of ice here. Two miles of ice that's moving, as you all know. It's moving toward the Weddell Sea. Someday this ice, this beautiful ice we're standing on, is going to make its way there and be part of our ocean. It's beautiful ice that I've been fortunate enough to walk nearly 4,000 miles on outside every day. That has helped to bond us, just as the fire might, in other instances, the ice has bonded us. Now soon, we're going to be leaving, sometime in November. Although I did get a message today that said something like it might take a little longer what? than yeah. originally scheduled. Does that scare anybody? No. Nope. Okay, yes. we got it. All right, all right. Don't worry about that. It'll all be okay. It'll all be okay. But there was there's just some discussion that you know the exact date, so to speak, might not be exactly what you think. But uh, we're going home, right? Yeah. One way or another, crew, we're going home. That's a fact. If we have to walk a thousand miles and, and do that, <laughs> who wants to do that? God damn, I thought there'd be more. All right. All right, I do. But okay. Um, so we're going home. And we're going home to a new world. We're going home to a world that uh, isn't quite what we left. Um, I don't know if we're going home to a better world. But you're on the verge right now of becoming a South Pole winner over. You'll be part of an exclusive group. It's only about 1,600 have ever done that, ever done that in the world. You'll be part of that group, um, a very exclusive group. So we go home, we're going to face these challenges, but you'll face it as a new person. You'll face it as a member of the South Pole 2020 Winter Over Crew. And goddamn, what's better than that? Thank you. Inspiration, huh? Yeah, beautiful, huh? 
All right, well, you got to see that. Very few people on the planet have seen that. That's at the South Pole in September of this year with a bunch of people that didn't really know what they were coming home to. So out of uh, my time at the South Pole, I've written a book. I'm not here to hawk a goddamn book tonight, let me tell you that. But I think I want to, I want to talk about it a little bit because it has a different perspective than, uh, than uh, you know, maybe most people because there, uh, that have been to the South Pole because I was in a leadership role, and I was in a leadership role longer than anyone's ever done before. So um, uh, over those winters, anyway. And it gives a, a, so let me read this to you. It's a, a, kind of an interesting perspective. My book is called Cold, by the way. And it's coming out in, it's, I've got a publisher, and it's coming out in the spring. The Amundsen Scott South Pole Station is a ship, a ship with a crew which sits atop nearly two miles of moving ice. The ship, the ice that holds it, and its crew are on a voyage, a voyage that will take several hundred thousand years before whatever is left of the ship, along with the ice that held it, will arrive at its final destination, the Southern Ocean. Its winter crew will change out annually or on a voyage of their own. That voyage will test some of them to their limits, and all to various degrees will be forever changed by the experience. While their icy voyage will not yield views of distant lands, it will give some crew members remarkable insight into unfamiliar places. These places will include who they really are as people and how their being impacts others. The crew will reside in their ship in nearly complete physical isolation from the world they knew. While inside, it will protect them from unearthly cold that few on the planet will ever experience. They will lose the sun and experience darkness, which will last for nearly half the year they are there. The ship and its crew will supply the light. I had the great honor of being the captain of that ship for three Antarctic winters. At the South Pole, at around minus 80 Fahrenheit, a strong exhalation will result in a strange whooshing noise from a very visible cloud coming from your mouth. At first, this noise surprises you, as you have breathed many thousands of times and never heard anything like it. The sound's origin is the fact that the water vapor from your breath is freezing incredibly rapidly and hurtling through the air. While out walking across the ice, you are startled by a loud cracking noise that sounds as if things are collapsing and you will be falling into oblivion. The cause of the noise is a small horizontal void space of air collapsing within the ice. Much to your relief, you do not disappear below the ice and walk on. When one is walking into the wind and not wearing goggles, you start to develop icicles dangling from your eyebrows and eyelashes. If one is out long enough, these may need periodic removal as vision can be obscured. From time to time, especially when facing into the wind, your eyelids may temporarily freeze shut. Squinting hard, shutting your eyes tighter will break the tiny ice seal and much to your relief, they can now be opened. You can see again. I experienced those things while at the South Pole and became used to them. I have heard of another phenomenon that occurs when the ice crystals are in the air in a certain configuration. When this happens, it increases acoustics to the point where one can hear normal conversations from long distances. I never experienced that. Outside, I was always alone. The ice and beauty of Antarctica did not call out to me. I never liked the cold. During my time at the South Pole, with much exposure to almost unimaginable cold, I would eventually love it. I would love it while still never liking it. Giving it any thought, cold is the opposite of life. When things die, they cool. Life for humans is about warmth, and it is abnormal to seek the cold. I learned to love and to embrace the cold, but it took time and the ability to recognize what it gave me. In the Midwest, where I grew up, there were very distinct seasons, and I well remember after the muggy heat of summer, the euphoria of a chilly autumn with sweaters and jackets. Then came the onset of winter, and most years, the wonders of a white Christmas. After New Year's, the novelty of the snow, ice, and cold wore off, and months of bleakness followed. Most birds, other animals, and humans took refuge awaiting the spring, and the white and icy world to me was cold and sterile. All right. I'm no writer. I'm no writer. I, uh, I uh, wrote a, got a couple of books, actually. You know, wrote this, and I have one that I really I wrote before about other things I did. Um, but I tell a tale, and that's something that, uh, uh, that I wanted to do with that book, and I think people will enjoy it because it gives a unique look at that program. Um, from, the, from the dynamics of how we hire people, some of the interviews, some of the stuff you wouldn't believe, to some of the things that occur there. Um, it's not a hit piece on the South Pole on the United States Antarctic program. It was the greatest honor of my life being entrusted with that station for three winters, nearly three years. And um, I want to make sure that uh, the book is respectful of that of the, that trust and confidence that they had in me. OK, Andy, you're running for it, aren't you? Because we're going to start the slideshow right now. <laughs> he moves quick. OK. <laughs> All right. Next, we've got, I got a PowerPoint program, which my lovely wife loves it. She get, last time I did a presentation, she gave me this. Slow down. I can't, because we've got to go. 
Am I okay tonight? All right, Wayne, hit me up. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go ahead with the PowerPoint program. All right, and you guys, you see the first slide? First slide. All right, um, this uh, presentation is three, three years at the South, three winters at the South Pole, and that photo shows my three crews, the 27 to 2017, the 2019, and the 2020 crews. Next slide, please. All right, um, I, you know, I can't read this, so this is gonna be interesting. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, the fact is, what this slide shows is it's a little bit about, it's about me. Um, it says a, a few things that uh, I'm a Marine. Um, started off as a, a Marine. That's how I got to California. I got a nice ticket to San Diego years ago and got to stand those yellow footprints at MCRD San Diego, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, let's see, I have uh, uh, a couple degrees, one from Cal State Fullerton here and another from Tulane. Um, I uh, had uh, done expeditionary travels in New Guinea, the Amazon, and Africa, and um, some hard trips, some of those things were hard trips that now in the days of this uh, bullshit reality TV stuff, um, it would be off the charts compared to the stupid shit they're doing now. But uh, they're different days, that's for sure. And I never wrote anything and never said much about that stuff back then. Um, you died in the Amazon, correct? Yes, I did. Yeah, I died down there, and I have a newspaper on my wall, and it says that, uh, that I was killed down there. But um, still here. Uh, I think. <laughs> All right, that's another story. All right, next, please. Okay, that's uh, the. Oh, the fun facts. Oh, God, can we out, please? Yeah, let's, try, I am, let's give it a okay. shot. Yeah, let me do this. I got so, eyes like a goddamn eagle, but kind of an old one, you know, an old eagle. <laughs> All right, let's do, the, I won't have to do this, other than the stuff that I wrote. But the fun facts, uh, the South Pole's at an elevation of 9,300 feet. That's the ice that is on old plates, old, uh, an old um, continental plate um, that goes way, way back. So we're at 9,300 feet, um, but there's a physiological factor that happens because of the, uh, because of the bar low barometric pressure that will actually make the body feel like it's up to 12,000 feet at times. And so that, uh, and so uh, a, a new arrival can, can, coming from the coast, McMurdo Station, the coast, can end up with um, uh, high altitude sickness, right? Getting right off the aircraft, and it happens. All, it happens all the time there. Um, summers, this is important. The summer of the South Pole lasts from November 1st to February 15th. Uh, during that time, it's light, 24 hours a day, and the, you can see the average temperature is 18F, and that's taken an average. It's gonna be colder at each shoulder from that, you know, from November 1st to February 15th. That's the summer, and it's light 24 hours a day. Summer to me, you might, I tell my crews, and they, they all live this, anybody that's been there in the summer, you might as well be in North Dakota. I mean, it's colder in Alaska in the wintertime than the pole in the, in the summertime. Um, not to minimize it, but I'm a winter over. That's a whole different thing. So let's go into what the winter's like. The winter is, is from February 15th, November 1st. During that time, it's dark. Much of the time, an average temperature is minus 76F. That's the average. So you'd have a range where it might get much warmer for a little bit, but when it's warmer, that means you're getting stuff blowing off the Weddell Sea. And when, you, when that happens, it gets warm, but then it's obscured. You usually got a lot of precipitation in the air, ice crystals and such. Much colder, uh, they'll get, it was the coldest it ever was when I was there, it was about minus 105. Next, please. I say don't have to yell. Okay, um, uh, this kind of shows you how the daylight stuff works. And you can see that about half the year it's light 24 hours a day. And then you start moving into these, into these other types of the twilight, the, the, the astronautical and the astronomical twilight. Toward the last two blues, the darker blues, you're getting pretty dim, and it's actually dark in, the, uh, in that, in that kind of navy blue thing. Um, it's, it's pretty darn, it's pretty dark. So we go through pretty much dark from about, you know, into, into April from uh, up till the very, the very end of August is, is pretty darn dark. So um, uh, that's the winter. Next. How do you get there? Well, this is getting here, I should say. You can get there a lot of ways now. You can get there, you can um, um, fly in on an aircraft, um, pay a bunch of money, come in as a tourist. That's a way to get there. There's, there's people that ski there that, that like to take our spot road our, that I'll show you later. They like to say that they recreated what uh, a, a famous explorer that was actually great did um, by taking our spot road, which is, uh, has uh, flags and has been checked for uh, crevasses all the way to McMurdo. Quite an adventure doing that um, and then bragging about it later. But uh, um, that's basically the process from electronic 
application all the way down to the, the to the training, which I'm going to go into. And that alone, you know, you can talk all night about that, like what what happened because I was in those interviews and what it's like sitting in the the live interview with someone that wants to go to the South Pole and looking over at somebody like I'm looking at Alec and I'm knowing I'm knowing that this guy wants to go bad. He wants to go bad, so he's going to say any goddamn thing he can that he thinks is going to impress me that he wants to go. And so you then you have to ask harder questions and you have to look into other things with. Uh, you know, with um, the person. And I'm, I'm pretty good at assessing. Um, what I can assess real well is I can assess uh, the maniac and I can assess, uh, you know, the, the person that's just totally unfit. But I can't necessarily assess the, the guy that might be kind of mediocre at the interview, but then later turns into a superstar. You have those kind of people that really rise to the occasion. But that process of getting there, uh, as at least with our program, is is um, it's quite something that people go through to do it. And plus with a medical evaluation that where they check things like they do a gallbladder ultrasound and if you have any uh, any type of uh, sludge in there or any kind of gallstones, you're not going. Um, there's all kinds of disqualifiers for why why you won't go. And as you mentioned, I see you see in there that we did have psychological testing. Uh, we gave that up. It, it turned out the people that failed it should have gone. But anyway, it was kind of, uh, there's some funny stories in that. I had that stuff in my book about <laughs> Maniacs and how they, you know, what happens with that test. But um, uh, it's pretty rigorous getting there. By the time a person gets to the South Pole, it's usually pretty rigorous. You also, you do have these last minute guys that kind of fall into place. You need a plumber. Your plumber that you had all summer is gone. Something happened to him, and all of a sudden, you know, this guy that was on a list gets brought in. It didn't go through all the training and stuff. But it's a rigorous process, the US Antarctic program getting there. Okay, next, please. All right, that's just an org chart of my 2020 crew. And um, it's fuzzy, and it doesn't matter that you can read everything. But we were supposed to have 43. We ended up with 42. We lost one of the scientists. Uh, but it had a really cool program he was going to do. But it just shows you what the kind of jobs are at the South Pole. Like, I'm, I'm in there as the, uh, the winter manager. And then below me, you have things like um, the IT people. Then you have the uh, um, you know, vehicle maintenance and the food service. And then the scientists off to the side, all the different science projects we have, which you saw in the video, um, uh, and uh, the maintenance folks, and uh, you know everything from a plumber to a carpenter to all these things that'll keep that station running. Because what the winter crew is all about is keeping that station up and operational. So you need the expertise to be able to operate that station with with no help from the outside whatsoever. Next, please. All right. Th this is part of the process. For if we do a team building session, I'm addressing that was the 2020 crew. I'm addressing them and talking about some of the issues and things we need to work on. A bunch of these guys, some of these guys were veterans from the previous years. But that particular crew, let's see. No, that's a 2019 crew. There are a lot of veterans on that crew. That was a hell of a crew. Um, uh, anyway, getting them ready to go. Team building, working together, and all that. Next. There's no 911 at the, uh, there's no 911 at the South Pole. Um, you get a call, which we do, and we did, fires here and there. You got to do something. You got to do something quick, and nobody's coming. So we go through fire training. It's a week at the Aurora Fire Academy, which is pretty damned intensive. They put you in the fire, and you got to feel the heat. And uh, it, uh, it's still, it's only a week training. And then we practice after that, which I'll show you. Next, please. They give you a cool photo at the end with this fire burning behind you, and then they send you off, and now you're, now you're the fire department at the South Pole. <laughs> God damn, we, uh, I'll tell you what, that's something else. Next. All right, deploying. So you deploy. We deployed from uh, after the uh, one year after team building and another year after the, the emergency training. Fly to, uh, from Denver, you fly to Auckland, New Zealand, and from Auckland to Christchurch. And Christchurch, New Zealand is where the Antarctic uh, um, Deployment Center is. I'm there in the Christchurch Deployment Center uh, preparing to board an aircraft. Next. All right. That's not it. All right, that's a C-17. Some of you guys are familiar with that. You generally take C, in past years, you would take C-17s to the ice. Uh, they actually land on the ice at McMurdo Station. Um, this year, because of what happened with Air National Guard and the COVID and all that, we didn't have C-17s available. Next. That's aboard the C-17. Someone's saving that picture, and I saw I was in it. I did a little circle on there. But anybody that's been in C-17s, um, it's a hell of a lot more pleasant than uh, than the C-130. It's only, I don't know how many hours it is, uh, like three and a half, under four hours on the C-17, and it's like seven hours or almost on the C-130, and that C-130 is cramped. Um, I've been on C-130s all over the world in my, in my contracting experience, but um, 
which I didn't really mention, it was on that slide, uh, and it's kind of important, I need to mention that, but um, I, uh, let's see, I don't think it's coming up, I think it was on there. I've been working around the world for the last 25 years. Um, uh, I've been gone for most of that in remote sites around the world. Um, so, so prior to my Antarctic, uh, my Antarctic position in 2016, I'd been around the world starting with Diego Garcia, uh, Singapore, which was part of that project, uh, Midway to, um, uh, from Midway to Shimia Island, Alaska, the very end of the Aleutian chain, from there to Iraq, from there to Kuwait, Kuwait to Wake Island, out in the tiny little atoll, from Wake Island to uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan to Saudi Arabia, and then from there to Ascension Island, and then on to the South Pole. Uh, so that was 25 years where I wasn't home very much. Okay, next please. All right, so there you are. You're on the C-17, you're getting off at the field there. Next, in Antarctica, McMurdo Station. Next. So sorry, folks. Uh, for some reason, the, net, the program just stopped working. So we're going to reset, and it's going to take a few minutes here. So if I can give it one second, folks. While we're waiting, is any questions right now? You can certainly ask a question. We've got a couple minutes. Yes, sure. Yes, sir. So you land, you all get off the plane. Is that the six months worth of provisions, or does the plane come? Okay, I'm going to talk about that because all I'm here, all I am at this point in time is at McMurdo. McMurdo, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, and I'll, I'll mention that, I want to get through McMurdo as quickly as possible and get to the pole. I never, McMurdo wasn't my thing. Um, it's a big place. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of people, and it wasn't my thing to be there. And that, left from New Zealand? New Zealand to McMurdo, and then from McMurdo, a smaller aircraft, which I'll show you, to the South Pole, another three or four hours. Kevin. Yeah, did you ever have any security issues where instead of firemen, that's a really good question because that could happen, and that's why we 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 um, we interview people and we look for 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 any signs of violence. For example, when I interviewed, and it's in some of the stuffs in the book, kind of humorous stuff. I mean, I think it's humorous, but um, sitting there with one guy, and uh, there's a question we ask everybody, and it was describe working how you handle a difficult coworker, and the guy said, the guy said, well, um, I. Uh, she kicked me in the balls because I broke her thumb or something. I don't know which way it went. <laughs> or said, all right. So, so that was during his interview. He said that. And of course, I tried not to laugh. You know, I'm biting, I, I'm tasting blood because it's so funny. And the interview's over, see, at that point. Because this happened at work. He, he, how did it happen? She kicked him and then he broke her thumb. So he's just trying to explain that the reason he broke her thumb was because she kicked him like she did. Now, now this is a guy that you, you, know, you probably wouldn't want on the crew. Um, an another one, I re remember this because I didn't hear it, and I asked my boss, what did he say? And my boss said, he said he'd kill us all if he wasn't hired. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, and he had this weird goatee, you know, and he was stroking it, and he, you know, I didn't hear it, but uh, my boss swore that's what this dude said. And so I remember telling the receptionist later, if that guy with the goatee come, tries to come back, don't open the door. Yes, sir. Yeah, real quick, just, yeah. just so you know, I'm gonna repeat, because I think I'm the only one mic'd up, so I'm gonna repeat whatever you say, Bob. Just so you know. Why did they eliminate the psych exam, and how did that work out? Yeah. So, so Bob's question was, is why they eliminate the psych exam, and how did that work out? Here's why. Interview? Because we found that it was taking people out that we didn't think were really, really crazy. It did get to truly crazies, but we thought we could see that, too, and I think we did. But what it, what it, what it was doing was, it was, for example, it was getting a lot of our mechanics. We were having a hard time hiring mechanics. <laughs> and, I mean, the mechanics, there's something about a mechanic that works maybe on their own. So maybe things are like, maybe when they ask questions about being social or how they work with other people, maybe they end, end negative. Like for example, I didn't answer that. You think I could answer that thing honestly? Are you kidding? So uh, I had to leave, no, it wasn't that bad. But stuff like this, for example, do you like to go to parties or would you like to say, yeah, I like to go to parties. That's what I said. Is that the right answer or the wrong answer? That's probably the right answer because the other was, I want to stay in my room and hang myself. You know, <laughs> so you don't, you don't want that. So, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, is, is that um, I kind of know they were looking for this introvert that they were afraid of. What I found out was you can be damned introverted at the South Pole as long as you're not crazy. And like I told one guy, I did say that, said as long as you don't hang yourself in your room. And then I knew as soon as I said it, I shouldn't have said it because he looked at me like, well, I could do that. And I was like, no. <laughs> Uh, so I never said that to anyone ever again, you know, because then he'd say later, the station manager said, yes. Wayne, what was the most common maintenance issue you had during the wintering over months? 
Well, right, so, wait, wait, real quick, so I got to reset it. What was the common, most common maintenance issue you encountered? While you were there over the well, we months. had a great maintenance crew, and they have to take care of everything. But the most important thing was our generators, was keeping those generators. That's the, that's the heart of the ship. And if you don't have those generators, you don't have warmth. And if you don't have warmth, it gets cold in that station real fast. So let's just say we paid more attention to the, uh, you know, to the generators, to our power generators, than we did the lighting or something like that. But that would be our number one. But we had all kinds of maintenance issues, and we would hire these guys that could do all kinds of things. We hired these really jack of all trades and and I had some fine people on my crew yes sir your first winter over what was the job interview like did you pursue the job or yeah were you recruited who hired you yeah wait wait the yeah. restatement no, so you your first winter over were you hired on or did you pursue the job how was the hiring process for you process was I had been I had applied years before when I was like in Iraq, and I, but I couldn't make the timeline or something happen, and they considered me an alternate for the job. So years later, I'm out at Ascension Island. Beautiful job. I'd only been there about seven months at the time. I was going to be spending the next five or six years there and probably be able to bring you out. We didn't have all those cats then. And uh, she went crazy. You got cats everywhere now. But anyway, I love every one of them. So the point is, is that um, no, they didn't recruit me. They didn't know. But I sent an application in from Ascension, and I, God, I debated it. And I thought, I just landed this dream job. I'm the station manager at Ascension Island, South Atlantic. I got a job for the next five years. It's a, I love the place. And then a uh, tiny little remote place, you know, Brazil and Africa, in the middle of nowhere. Perfect, perfect job. And then I saw, I don't know why I even saw it. I saw this ad. There it was, the winter manager. And I applied, and I thought, they probably won't call me. You know, they, how, how did it compare to Shackleton's ad? Um, <laughs> I like not not quite as sexy. Well, they didn't. They try to play it up like everything's swell. That's the difference. I don't. When I talk to people, I was harsh and told them what could happen. Yeah. The, the program doesn't tell you that. Oh, it's wonderful. Everyone's nice. You have food and you have all this stuff. They don't tell you. If the generators go out, it's going to be minus 100 and you're going to be in this station. You know. So they tell you it's a little different the way the program does. I was more realistic. The point was um, I sent my application in thinking, ah, I'm just doing it. And then, God damn, it was like the next day I'm called and they want me to come for this interview. And I came for the interview and I'd had all, they don't have guys like me that have all that experience working overseas. It's usually someone from another crew that they promote up. So I was an unusual thing and they knew of me from those years ago. So that's how I was, how I was hired for the job. Well, to paraphrase Shackleton's ad, I think it was yeah. something like low wages, slim chance of return, yeah. like constant darkness. But like eternal glory for the crew that goes out. So like, and you had a yeah. line around the block. As well, I and I'll tell you something that, that the truth is, that ad never existed. It didn't exist. It's that you'll see p old sepia tone photos of it and stuff now, but it, it was, it, there's a story behind it. You can Google it if you're interested in where it really comes from. Not that he didn't think that, but it really wasn't that ad, but he probably told them that. Um, like I said, when I interview people, I was much more clear on what they were getting into. I didn't sugarcoat it. Yes, sir, in the back. Which one? The, oh, um, was built? So, so uh, the question is, yeah. how did the Amundsen-Scott station come into existence? That's a great story. 1956, 1957, the first group of Navy Seabees. Navy Seabees flew down there and built the first South Pole station, flying stuff in, parachuting it in. And it was just a small uh, footprint at that time. A few buildings, um, you know, communications and all that. Then it grew, and they built years later Aircraft brought in stuff, same thing, and brought in the geodesic dome. Some of you have seen pictures of the old dome. That sunk beneath the ice, and then the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station was built um, uh, around 2008 or so, something like that. But it was a magnificent effort done by aircraft for the most part. And they might have pulled some stuff. I don't know if the spot, no, they didn't have the spot, then, I don't think. But um, incredible planning to put that station together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the station. Incredible. To, to put that station. It shows something about the power of the United States that we can do such a thing at the South Pole. Are we okay? How's our slides? That, that's a great segue, Wayne, uh, because we are back up and running. I just didn't want to slow your roll. So. Okay. No, I say we Let's saved some time going. for later then, some of the questions. So we used it all. All right. So we were getting off an aircraft there at McMurdo. Next, please. Um, 
McMurdo to me, I, I'm sorry, I, I did learn to appreciate it. I was always really down on it, and I won't go into some of the reasons why, but uh, it's just got a different mentality than the South Pole does. But McMurdo has some fantastic stuff, and one of the things is this is Scott's di Discovery Hut. This was built by Captain Scott in around 1903 uh, when it, on his first expedition with the Discovery, and it's still there. Next. Wayne, can you give a bit more background on Robert Fowler and Scott? Yeah, yeah, yeah um, that was Scott's first hut, 1903, 1907, or 1905, whatever, when he was there. And he, uh, Scott was down there on the British Antarctic expedition that uh, was going to, his first expedition, 1903, 1907, wasn't necessarily going to make it to the South Pole. They knew that. It was more gathering science data. It was more trying to make the furthest south. Um, uh, no one had really been, spent the kind of, had been as far inland as Scott took it. It was important because he had Ernest Shackleton on his crew that year and a bunch of other guys that later became quite famous in polar history. So it was kind of a first footstep in Antarctica by the, by the British. Uh, so that, that's old hut. He came back later and, and I'll talk, and made it, actually made it to the South Pole. Well, Next. And the current hut is like frozen in time, correct? Like yeah. you can step in and it's there's, like walking into a time machine. There's still old food things and stuff like that from the scut. That hut was Discovery Hut from 1903. They built that hut and then they found out they didn't, they didn't even like being in there. It was too cold, drafty, it was a problem. So the people, they slept on the ship, which iced in and they stayed on the Discovery. When he came back for the final expedition where he made it to the South Pole in 1909, 1911, um, this, his ship, uh, his ship, the Terra Nova, actually dropped them off. They made their camp at, at Cape Evans, and then the ship left. So they actually stayed at the Cape Evans hut, which is frozen in time to this day. Uh, this is a, a cross. This is Seaman Vincent's cross. He was lost on Scott's first expedition uh, in a terrible snowstorm, wearing finescos, which were a type of hide boots, slid off a hill into the ocean, and his body was never found. Next. So making a quick exit from, from uh, McMurdo, I would arrive on the Basler. And you aircraft, half a sedan, whatever, aircraft interested people, that's a DC-3. It's a modified, beautiful old DC-3. The airframes are from the 1940s, operated from a, by a Canadian company that has the contract. Um, modified, updated electronics and all that. Probably everything's updated, but the airframe does go back to the 1940s. Uh, I would come in on that because that would land a little bit earlier at the end of October, sometime at the end of October. Next. Most people come in on the LC-130. That's a C-130, the only difference being, if you notice, it's got skis, okay? So it, it lands, and that's how most people get there. Next, please. That's the South Pole. <laughs> <laughs> it's all north from there. Next, please. There's the station. That was a good question about how it got there, because imagine this thing, 50,000 square feet plus, counting these other parts of the station. Um, that we put that together there, it was an engineering marvel. And I, 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 gotta, I gotta go fast, because people are gonna get tired, and you probably already are. Next, and people can ask me later. This is an aerial photo, which is interesting, because um, you'll see the station, that was taken from about 10,000 feet, and from that you can see um, the science buildings, which you've seen in the video, and you can see to the top is the, uh, is the uh, communications area. And I would walk, I had walked, which I'll go into a little bit later, both those areas. Um, some with a flag line and some I was just out on my own. Next, please. I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the station. I'm gonna make this real quick, because it's getting later. Communications room, next. Uh, my office, next. Large conference room, next. Large art conference room, it's important because that's a signed copy of Roald Amundsen's book, signed by Roald Amundsen, next. That's Admiral Byrd's uh, sweater that he wore on his trip over the South Pole. Next. And, and to clear out, Roald Amundsen was a member of this, honor member of this yeah, club. Yeah. And Admiral Byrd, I believe, visited multiple yeah. times. Yeah, Roald Amundsen, I, I'm sorry, I wish I could do things just on the history because uh, Roald Amundsen was a great hero of mine. They all are. Next. We're all in their shadows. The hallway. Next. Uh, the science lab. Next. B3 lounge. A lot of fun stuff happens in there. Next. Computer lab, next. Clinic, you don't want to go there, next. Our, our, our doctor, um, we don't have a dentist. The doctor takes like a, a course, like a one week or couple day course in dentistry. <laughs> and that's why we have a really strict dental thing because you don't want to have your doctor try to fix your teeth. Next. This is an important hallway. These photos here, this, those photos at top left, 
is the first winter over crew, 1956-57. And every crew has a photo taken, and they are immortal, as I mentioned. That's what I was talking about in that video. Um, they become immortal and become part of the crew that will be there forever. As long as the U.S. has a presence at the South Pole, there will be a crew photo. Next. The store. Look at that. Some alcohol there, too. Huh? Who would have thought? Um, interestingly enough, just to go into that, to talk about leadership and such, uh, my leadership style, uh, seeing the alcohol kind of brings this up. Uh, I care about these guys. I, I really do. But the fact of the matter is I go back this more in the book a little bit. I keep a golf. That's my style. I kept a golf between all three of my crews. I was there for them, but I wanted the golf. I didn't drink for uh, the three years I was there. No drink until we were done. Then I'd have a drink with the crew after a, sometimes a year, because I was there the two summers. You know. Then I'd have a drink with the crew. I was on duty 24 hours a day. Anything could happen. Um, so uh, just to set that example, I never had a drink until, until uh, the end of the I'd have a drink with the crew. Uh, the one exception to that, we had an off-ice death that was uh, a crew member that should have been with us that something terrible happened while he was off ice and we had a memorial service and I led a toast for him. Next. Quiet reading room. Next. Laundry. People ask about laundry. Two loads a week. Or no. Let's see. One load a week. I used to do mine on Saturday. Next. We get two showers a week. Two two-minute showers a week. Water is, is, is something that we can serve. And I'll show you. Next. Uh, B3 Lounge, watch a lot of movies. Next. Re Wayne, yeah. real quick. Yeah. It might be a good time to mention, I think you've mentioned a film festival that happens when the crew first gets down to the South Pole. Yeah, there's, and I thought I had that first slide. I, I, I thought it, I think it showed us in the, I wonder what happened. I think it was there. The fact is, here's what happens. When, you, when, the, when the doors close, maybe it's coming up, but uh, when the doors close, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's coming up. I'll tell you about that. Next, because I think I have a slide of it. Okay, maybe I don't. This is important. These are poll markers. Um, these are poll markers, geographical poll markers. And they got to say a certain thing. There's a certain, there's a certain um, thing that they have to have to be actual poll markers. And these are early ones, which are fairly primitive. You can see the, they're fairly primitive in design. Um, but then as the years and people get, you know, we get really cool machinists and better machines. Next. All right. They end up being works of art. Now, what happens is the crew actually comes up with a design. They come up with a design, and they then, um, they then uh, come up with a design, and the crew votes. Uh, I take a look at it to make sure that it's acceptable. There's certain parameters that I want to watch for. Um, and then we end up uh, checking with the National Science Foundation we work for to make sure that they're OK with our design. Um, and so next is the, this was the 2000, 17 crew did this and was placed, which I'll show you. It was placed, um, it was placed on the ice uh, January 1st, uh, 2018, and I did that. Now, sometimes there's designs that are submitted that don't make it. Some of them I really like. Next. W were there any prominent designs you had to veto? <laughs> yeah. You see, you see, I see this one? All right. Someone submitted that. And, um, I, uh, God damn, why we didn't do that with the polar bear, with the, <laughs> and I actually talked to my boss about it, and I said, and then they said, well, Wayne, you should make one much bigger and put it out there as a permanent thing, and, well, actually, I said that, but the fact was that, <laughs> then I had to talk to the psychologist afterwards, and no, I didn't. I like, it was cute anyway. The polar bear, you know, the significance that there's no polar bears in the South. Um, there are designs that are, some could consider unacceptable. Next. Okay. <laughs> I have to veto sometimes, you know, when, I, when people come up with these ideas um, and, say, and say, you know, I, I get where you're coming from, but um, we just can't go that route. So there you go, graphically. Next. That's placing it. That's a January 1st, 2018. 90 degrees, January 1st, putting that thing. What an honor, huh? Placing that thing at 90 degrees south. Next. Okay, hallway from my room, next. My room, we each got our own room, tiny little things, like a cabin on a ship. Uh, a lot of our, not, a lot of our, 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 our wording, our, uh, the nomenclature for the station was ship oriented. Uh, we ate in a galley, uh, work, walked on a deck. Um, some of the things were portholes, we had a crew. So there's sort of a nautical connotation to the pole. Next, 
All right, my room again. And next, this last one I have on here for another reason. See the, the humidifier, because the humidity at the pole is so little. There's so little humidity there that uh, uh, people use humidifiers. And I don't think they work that well, but I like the noise. Kind of got this white noise thing going on like an aquarium. Next. The view out the back of my room. Next. Stairs leading down to another part that some will find interesting. Next. So, Wayne, quick question, sorry to interject, yeah. but during the winter months when it's dark outside, you have to block up your windows, correct? Yeah. To avoid light pollution yeah. for the, the yeah. Uh, telescopes? Yeah, we do that. There's a certain day that everybody's really happy about. Uh, the only day they get happier is when you get to take them off when the sun comes back up. We actually block all the windows from inside because we, we don't want the station emitting light that would affect our, our, our telescopes. Next. See, I'm going kind of fast, but I have to. to. All right, there's our power plant, uh, three diesel generators and a, and a peaker unit. Next, we have an emergency power plant. Which, uh, it's one of our Caterpillar diesels. Next, there they are. Next. You have a water maker too? Yeah, going into that. Okay, here's some of our snow equipment. Next. Snow equipment, snow vehicles. Next. Another one. Looks like I think I'm lost in space, I think. Next. Okay, we have, uh, I already did that one. The, uh, this is, uh, Marine Corps birthday. Um, we, when I'm there, we always celebrate that. <laughs> Next. All right, so there's the spot team. That's what I'm telling you about. Those guys drive up from McMurdo. Now, they take a circuitous route, not the same as the early explorers. They're not going up the Almonds and Axel Heiberger, and they're not going up uh, Sha or, um, what Shackleton found, um, the, the Beardmore Glacier that Scott took later. They go all the way up around and take the, uh, the Leverett Glacier, which is much easier. They have a, a ground penetrating radar that's in front that checks for crevasses the whole way, and they put flags every 100 yards. So there's actually a road that these guys um, drive in, and they bring us our fuel, uh, approximately 300 or so thousand gallons pulled on fuel bladders. Next. How long does that trip take? It takes them like a month. It takes them a while. The first one takes longer because they're checking for crevasses. The next one is quicker. It's a few weeks. But it's, they're out there. It's quite, a, it's quite a thing. I'd love to have done it. Is, is that the only way to get fuel to you during the we winter We get months? it on aircraft, too. And remember, it's closed. When I, I need to be clear that when, it comes, when it's January or February 15th, there's nothing else coming in there. There's no more fuel. It's what you have. There's no more. So the way we get fuel is those fuel bladders that are pulled. And then the aircraft that come through the summer, the C-130s might have 800, might have 2,000 and we take the, the fuel from them too. And so it adds up to around, we want to have about 500,000 gallons going into a winter. Next. All right, important day. That's the day Robert Falcon Scott arrived at the South Pole and died on the return journey. Died on the return journey. Next. I was outside a lot. This is running. Next. That's running out to the telescope along the flag line using for laps or running around. Next. That's running. I was surprised someone got that photo. Someone was out on the, on the ski way. One of our firemen and took that one day when I was out the grid south route, out away from the station. So, Wayne, two, two quick things you might want to mention is, one, I think the film festival is of interest in terms of what movies you choose yeah, to show. Yeah, and I thought I had a slide here. I, thought, I must have skipped over it. And, and then also the attire that you personally chose to wear. While yeah, we're South getting Pole. into that. But let me go into the, this. We have, what, what we have is when that station closes, oh, you know what? We are leading into that. That's okay. Next, it, I, think, I think I show it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There it is. So what happens is one day, it's February 15th, they're gone, or around that time, 14th, sometimes 13th, sometimes 16th. They all leave, we wave goodbye. Some people get scared, I've heard. I, I always look forward to it myself. They're not coming back. Nothing's coming back till November, no, end of October, November. So you just gotta know that. What do you do? Next. You get together in the, in the, movie, in the theater and you watch a movie. We watch The Thing, all three versions of The Thing. <laughs> I want to prepare the crew, prepare the crew for the winter. So what's better than that? You know, an alien thing. And I used to tell this funny story. I got to say, funny story. I, I, I always do this thing where I think stuff's funny. And then my wife always says, you thought it was funny. Like, maybe others don't. But I don't get it. Anyway, so the funny story I would say is I'd get up in front of the crew and go, see, there's a, the myth about having a station gun. Do we have a station gun? People think there's a station gun. So I'll ask who believes in a station gun. You'll get kind of some lukewarm, you know, this and that. I'll say... How many bullets do you think I have if I have the station gun? And, a, and our crew's 42, so I'd always say, I have 41. 
I thought it was funny. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> next. Wait, was there a station gun? I'm not going to say. <laughs> next. All right, sun goes down. Starts getting dark. Next. Really goes down. Next. The green flash, some of you guys have seen this in tropics and other places. Is Same. that real? It's real. I mean, it's, in the, it's caught in the photo. I, uh, you know, it's for something that happens, some refraction or whatever. Next. Then you got this. All right. Now I'm going to tell you that some of these photos coming up are somewhat enhanced. Uh, personally, um, I don't know. My night vision isn't really that good. So I wasn't seeing what you're going to see because they aren't long time exposures, but there's some exposure time with the camera. So it caught some beautiful shots that are slightly better than what you would see. Next. Like, but there's the aurora, the aurora australis. We have the aurora borealis up north. We have the aurora australis down south. The aurora, beautiful thing caused by ionizing something on the electromagnetic, some shit, whatever. But it's, <laughs> it's green and it's really beautiful. Next. How you like that? How's that great description? I get some, one of my science guys could get up here and, and tell you exactly what it, what it is. Look at that. It's beautiful. Next. You know where you are there. You're not the North Pole. You got those stars revolving around that southern, southern. Next. And these aren't my photos. And I should give photo credit for who these are. We have several people that have taken these photos. Hunter Davis was one of our, um, one of our cooks who took some of these spectacular things. And then there's one coming up that Danny Hampton did who did those videos. Next. Look at that. Next. All right, what do we do there? Well, we work. You know, everybody's got a job, which you kind of saw to keep that station alive and operational. But we have fun, too. Um, we put events on. And one thing, you know, as a leader I've learned is you want people actively engaged and involved and doing fun stuff. That stuff, too, that doesn't always revolve around drinking. Because you'll find yourself in remote sites so many things will evolve around drinking. And at the South Pole, while well, you're going to have that, you know, you want, to, you want to keep it under control. So we had talks and a lot of things. And next, I did this one. All right. That was my night. Saturday night, 7 o'clock, adventure movie night with Wayne. And we would get together, and there was a, I was showing the movie South, the old black and white um, movie South um, from Shackleton's expedition. And try to make a little bit more wholesome for the crew and also particularly the second and third years, I brought things from my personal collection. I brought a little piece of the endurance spar that I have. I brought a, a little uh, a candle holder that came off uh, the Terra Nova, the ship to Terra Nova. Um, I brought other things from, from other, from other, for other programs that we did, pieces of my collection. I wanted my crew, I wanted my crew to understand the people that have gone before us. I do that everywhere I work, remote sites. They need to understand the sacrifice that these guys made, and I, I can't do them the, any justice tonight and talk what I'd like to say about Roald Amundsen's approach and Captain Scott's and what Ernest Shackleton did. But these were giants. These were giants, these men were. And, um, and I want my, always wanted my crews to understand and appreciate those that had gone before us. So history was a big part of, of, of being, me being the station manager for the winter. Next. Food. The food's great. Um, Left hand, that's important. Those are, I did this for my 17 and my, no, my 19 and 20 year. And that was actually the 19 year. We made sledging biscuits like Scott would have had or Amundsen. We had pemmican. We had some dried fish, uh, two types of pemmican. And um, I wanted them. And that cake that actually, uh, I got the idea from this series, The Last Place on Earth. If anyone's ever seen The Last Place on Earth, Amundsen made a cake like that. So I showed the still of it to my cook and said, can you make this cake that shows that shows you know, the Ross Sea and all the way to the South Pole. I wanted them to feel that history, especially on the greatest n night, which to me was midwinter. And that was our midwinter dinner. Um, beautiful dinner, great food. We also ate a lot of ramen noodles. So, next. All right, this is important because things happen to you when you're at the South Pole. Things happen to you. And you know, the stresses and things that occur to a crew member who's at the South Pole that has no way out um, and I just want to give a couple examples myself, and then I'll talk about some other people. Uh, but I've got a house in Rockport, Texas. It's a beautiful old house. This is the Baylor Norville House. There's a Texas historical plaque on the front of the house. Um, next, it's got a nice view. Okay, sits on the water, it was built in 1868. Next, it's got a collection in there that's got some very interesting things that I've collected around the world, and a lot of stuff from auctions and stuff, too. You, these days, the really fine stuff. In that room, there's a wall dedicated to when I was in Afghanistan. There's a wall from the Sudan, wall from African stuff. 
um, Indian, and then behind me is another a bunch of Indian stuff, and um, the house is uh, the house is you know filled with this type of thing. Next, this is the green room. This is where I found that Webley. Eh. Anyway, um, the green room has some some cool stuff. It's mostly old stuff. However, there is one thing that's new in there that I just kind of left. If you see that Maasai shield, kind of to the right, middle right, there's a hat that's up on a set of African shooting sticks. That's Val Kilmer's hat from the movie Ghost in the Darkness. That's his hat. His head's smaller than mine. I can't wear that. So, but anyway, now think about it. I got this house. I got this thing on the water. I'm at the, I'm at the pole, and um, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting uh, hurricanes, right? We live in a hurricane alley there. And so I'm hearing there's a hurricane in the Gulf. Now, most, for most of the time um, through the years, Melissa and I have faced this. It's uh, the stuff, uh, it turns. It diminishes into a storm, and we all laugh and just get a little bit of rain. And I'm watching this thing every day, and the damn thing, I'm willing it to turn. I don't want to will it on someone else, but I'm really trying from the South Pole to will this thing to turn, diminish. And it's not. It keeps going straight. It stays on this same, on this path. And then finally it's, oh, shit, this thing is imminent. And I'll never forget, one day, right before the Internet went down, because it goes down, it's only up a few hours, I got to see this. Next. Okay, Rockport, Texas made the news because Hurricane Harvey came ashore as a Category 4 hurricane. And um, I'm at the pool, and I don't know. My lovely wife uh, and a couple of cats evacuated, and so I, uh, I uh, um, didn't know for several days that that house was still there. I and pictured African spears flying through the air, and my 17-foot dugout canoe is floating in Aransas Bay, you know, back in the water after all those years. And I'm picturing the worst, but I'm most concerned about my cats. I got to admit, it was the cats that she couldn't take. There were so many that really went to my core that, um, that bothered me the most. Uh, what could happen to them if water came ashore? So after a few days, I got the photos came in of what the house was like. And I, next, it was still there, um, still there. It had some damage, roof shingles taken off. Next. Um, blew a window out. I have a guest house behind there that had some issues, but for the most part was intact. I was happy to see that. Next. The place was a mess, though. Now, the point I'm making about this is not to show my personal travail, but to show that I'm the winter manager. If I did things right, none of my crew members even knew anything about that. I can never show that I'm going to be upset by anything, that anything is bothering me. That's my style. Those guys come first. The crew always comes first. Not some stupid thing. Well, it's not really stupid losing your house, but um, the fact is is that the crew comes first. As a leader, you've got to let that stuff go. You've got to let that go, and the crew comes first. They come over anything you do. They eat first. You take care of them, and the crew has to come first. So I just show an example. Imagine what that's like, knowing I might have lost all that stuff. But my primary responsibility was to the crew and to that station. And that's how it works, I think, if you're the winter manager that I would want to be. So we got problems like that. Then last year, we had this. Next. All right, this was a problem. Pandemic. When we were locked in and everybody left, we just knew about this. We weren't sure what was going to happen. And as things progressed, I had crew members that uh, had uh, um, all kinds of things happened that year, and I mentioned that during that talk. We had deaths, we had, we had uh, uh, unforeseen divorces where spouses decided once a significant other was down there, it'd be a good time to file for divorce. Uh, we had, there was a hurricane in another place. There were fires out in California, people's houses. There were all these things, and a crew member that had a sister that was facing, uh, had contracted the COVID and was facing amputations, and, uh, and I have to deal with this stuff, and I have to, and I, that third crew, which I'm, I just don't have time, but it was a different crew, um, different than the other two crews. They were a, a group of millennials um, that, that I, didn't, I didn't select because I did a back-to-back -back winter. I was there a first winter, then a second winter, and then they said, yeah, my boss asked me, will you stay that third winter? So rather than going back and then recruiting the next crew and not going back for another year, I went home for a few weeks and came back, and he promised me he, they would, they would choose the crew for me, so I wasn't involved in the selection process. So I, I, the crew came out, and I had this really strong millennial core, and it was, it was really different for me, because I hadn't been around these kind of people. And I'll just say this, you know, looking at it now, with all things, you know, I hadn't been around. Um, I shit, a millennial, I only wish there were more of them. I really do, with the way I look at things. I do, I damn well do. Anybody want to know why? 
Nobody cares? It's usually some people say I want to know why. How many millennials we have? Eh, anybody? I'm raising hey, my hand I'm in the a back. Millennial. All right, then, then you guys can relate to this. Here's what I told them when they asked me, because like, after I knew these guys a while. See, the thing is, I told them, I was a group up one day, and they said, how can you do this? Look at you, where you've been and all this, and you're around us, and you, you, you treat us decently. And I said, you know, guys, I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're a lion. Imagine you're in a lion in a world filled with rabbits. Rabbits all around you. Rabbits. It's goddamn good to be the lion. I said, imagine it, because you'll never feel that way, but I do right now, and I really like it. <laughs> so... So I'm the rabbit. So uh, the I'm the is, rabbit and you're the lion. And they can do great. They do really good with electronic stuff. They're really cool. Like this stuff. See, yeah, I can't do this. So they're really great with electronics on top of being possible food. Okay, let's go. Next. What a, what a compliment. <laughs> I feel so flattered. Welcome to my world, Alec. Uh, having some fun with that. I, uh, next. Okay, so, so it's, it's cold there. I, I did a lot of walking. I was outside a lot. Um, next. That's out in the dark, wearing a, a headlamp and um, out some distance from the station. Uh, I had two routes I did, um, and I'll go into the mileage and stuff a little bit later because I so Wayne, re I, I really don't mean to interrupt yeah, your no, flow. No, do, do. But please, I mean, I think that's such a fascinating thing that I remember reading articles when the COVID, you know, I think it was March when the club yeah. shut down, and it really felt like it happened in a day. Mm. I remember hearing it on the radio that the NBA was shut down for the season, and it felt like everything, including this club, within the day was shut down. So yeah. you being so isolated from yeah. that in kind of an ironic way because you'd expect it at the South Pole that you were prepping for all these personal emergencies that you could encounter. I'm Absolutely. Sure you, I'm sure you had a plan for walking the people out. Absolutely. You know, we, 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 we talk about it. I don't know if joke is the right word, but talk about, you know, what, what if the fuel were to stop coming? What, you know, what is yeah, the yeah. evacuation plan if no one comes yeah. for you? But all of a sudden, the outside world becomes the threat or becomes at least the, the place where, where things are, are happening. And it is this universal global thing. What is the experience this your third winter in? Yeah. When all of a sudden these crew members, especially a lot of them young people, yes, talking were. about we're having family that are scared about this or getting sick and they're in a place where they are almost, as you said, on the moon. Yes. Almost could have been as it were. Like we like to say, it's easier to get back from that International Space Shuttle. When you're up there, there's a thing you can eject and stuff. We can't get out. So let me tell you that, you know, and I had some fun. I told the millennial thing, my crew, I love my crew. I loved every one of them. I'd have done anything for any of them um, besides eat them. But the um, thing is, is, uh, is uh, um, that was, uh, was extraordinary where we didn't know. We didn't know at first. The thing, as you guys witnessed here, I'm listening to the news and seeing they're, all, they're buying all the toilet paper. What the hell is that? You know, but the toilet paper. And then you start wearing masks. We don't know about that. We've never done that. Then, then this shit starts happening with people's families and things. And then, and then these other things that occur. And um, interestingly enough, uh, when I mentioned that I have a golf, I do. And I want to keep it. And I would do that. I'm not someone's buddy there. That wasn't my thing. Um, but they could come to me at any time, and I was really always happy that people would come in and tell me things that sometimes with the younger people, uh, it's like, did I really need to know that? But, you know, it was like, if they f I'm honored that they trusted me enough to tell me about their sex life and about, you know, how it was going and all this. Um, so, uh, um, so, or not going. But anyway, uh, the point is, is that it was, it was absolutely unprecedented. And I have to t I'm talking to these people and trying to help get them through the winter. And um, with these off island, off ice things, and there was a there was a time, I'll never forget. I was in a galley one day, and, and it was in the when this was hitting hard. And someone says, "What do we do? What do we do if this thing morphs into a, a new type and it takes down the Air National Guard? They don't come." And I said, "Funny enough, I've been thinking about that, I've been thinking about what we might do." And I had actually informally kind of looked into some things, and they thought we'd go to McMurdo, try to get to McMurdo, and I said, "Not necessarily." If the world is that bad, we might take another route and head up the Palmer Peninsula because it would be farther, closer to South America, and we could get food, you know, the, the sea life and things there. That'd be in a total meltdown of the world. That would be, that's a disaster case, which, of course, we were never near. But as a leader, I had to think about that, that what if, what if? I, I try to stay a few steps ahead. And these guys were very concerned, and I was very concerned myself. So um, it was unprecedented. I mean, it could be a movie in its own right, just about that last season. It could be a book in its own right, just that. Uh, because there was nothing like it really be a, could be um, next please all right it's, it's cold there you can kind of see that's minus 101 or something but bottom right next 
this is getting back to what I wear. This one I wore. I had three different kinds of things I'd wear. And sometimes I'd mix and match this. So this is military type stuff. This is old stuff, actually. Military extreme cold weather gear. That's like level, a, a generation three. That's old. They're up to like nine or something now. But that was three. And I'd, I'd wear that a lot. That was almost like you know running clothes at drill. Um, uh, just uh, something I could wear. Um, I carried two lights, my headlamp and then a spare, and I had two compasses because I could get back. I'd learned, I can't go into all the stuff now, there's no time, but how I could get back under any conditions, it didn't matter anymore because of what I'd done, been out. Okay, so that was what I'd wear a lot of times um, with the military type stuff. Next, this next stuff, I really liked it. It was, it would, I could wear this, this is traditional. That's, a, that's an Amundsen anorak, um, kind of a canvas thing made in, uh, made in Norway. Uh, to Amundsen specifications. That's what he wore at the pole when he was there. But he was there in the summer. It was much warmer. And I could wear that through the summer, and I could wear it in the winter up to about minus 60 or so with that Shackleton sweater at minus 60. Those boots are moose hide. They were, they were, from, they were rated minus 40. I, could, I took them out to minus 100, but I had to be careful because I was afraid they'd break um, once they froze. Uh, my next is my next uh, is something. that I, That's my wolf skins. Um, let me say this, friend, you know, get anti-fur people, whether it's here or online, whatever. I am myself. I don't think any little animals, I don't like the thought of that, raising some little animal for his fur. I think it's kind of heinous. Um, this is Siberian. This is Siberian. I had it made, specially made to my specifications in Russia, uh, to roll Amundsen's specifications that he got from the Inuit. Um, and no one knows how to handle cold weather better than native peoples and the Inuit. And that, uh, um, you know, with fur, it's a touchy subject. And, uh, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks, what any person on the planet thinks. I apologize to the wolves, and that's all that really matters to me. The wolves got my apology, and they kept me warm uh, in temperatures colder than minus 100. It was warmer than any issue type things. Um, I got hot once. I was running a little bit at minus 104, and it started getting hot. But they're beautiful. And um, when I wore those, I also I found myself, if I was around people at all, they'd pet me sometimes. So I felt. <laughs> I know what a dog kind of feels like now after having those on. But they got to, let me tell you, the spirit is in those wolves still. And uh, uh, I always felt it, and I greatly respected them for what they gave. Next. So, w Wayne, quick question. Yeah. In terms of the animal furs, did you feel that they were more effective than the modern technologies? Yeah, like to I me, mentioned, the Gore-Tex? Or was it oh, more of a Gore connection to the history? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying you couldn't do that. The stuff that the Antarctic program gave you. But to me, it just felt more natural. And um, being out wearing those, man, there was a real aura. Now, let me tell you, I'm kind of careful with those. Because on Facebook, I got contacted by some people that want to know where to get them. Man, no. And I had one guy who was going down there to do something on the coast. And he was going to, you know, and I was like, dude. That's, that's a goddamn photo shoot that you want to do down there. Anybody on the coast, that's, that's the damn banana belt, as far as I'm concerned. The coast of Antarctica? Yeah, the coast of Antarctica. It's a goddamn banana belt. You don't wear wolf skins, that stuff. I wouldn't wear them in anything, um, anything uh, warmer than minus 50. Yeah, on the back. Speaking of fur, do you allow pets down there, and if not, Me. Have yeah, and that so, is such... Real quick, just to restate the question. Yeah. Do you allow pets at the, uh, the Antarctic uh, South Pole Station, and would that be good for morale? Absolutely, we don't, and it would be super. And I actually tried, once I had some, after my second winter, I'm going into third winter, when I had some, when the program knew me well, and I had a certain level of respect where I could you know, not look like you know, just somebody you know, asking a question, I pushed it once for us to get a dog. Because if you look at those first photos, that 1956, 57 photo had Bravo. Bravo was down there. A dog would be a wonderful thing for the station to have. They said it violates the Antarctic Treaty. Now I argue that, that at the South Pole, I know why you wouldn't have it on the coastal thing. It would make a bloody mess out of those penguins if it was ever loose or whatever. It really would tear them up. What's, oh, 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 take a goat. Actually, a goat, anything. A goat would be cool. A cat, you know, I'd love to have a cat. But the Antarctic Treaty forbids it. I tr actually tried, but they, they were pretty staunch that it's forbidden. But it would be wonderful for morale. Now, didn't you take a successor, a spiritual successor, yeah. to Mr. I forget what the, the specific Mr. name Chippy. of the cat was. I Mr. Gotta, Chip. I meant to bring Mrs. Chippy tonight. It is Chippy, a, Mr. Chippy. <laughs> Mrs. It's a long story. It's from the Shackleton expedition. And I got a, a facsimile of the of the. I was going to tell you it was a stuffed cat, but it's not. It's not a stuffed cat. My lovely wife, if I stuffed one of my cats, it's not real. I mean, it was literally a stuffed cat, right? Well, it, no, it was, I think it's rabbit fur. It's rabbit fur. It's not really cat fur. But it, it's, it, it's a cat. It looks like a cat. And it was, I got it 
um, supporting the Kent Sea Scouts, which are a wonderful group that are recreating the voyage of the quest uh, in Kent, England, and it's going to happen this year. And it's a wonderful cause. Um, and I got it as, um, as a, for a donation, and I took Mississippi, and I, I meant to put the slide and I didn't, to the South Pole with me, because uh, Mississippi, which was actually a boy cat, uh, died on the endurance expedition. It had to be shot or different stories, what might have happened, had to be done, terrible thing. Um, so I was able to take Miss Chippy to the South Pole with me. Next, please. Hey, Wayne. Yeah. Uh, when you were running, were you not concerned that the, the cold air would, might damage your lung cells since it was so cold? To, re to restate, yeah. when you were running at the South Pole, you were not worried that the cold air would damage your lung cells permanently in terms of that much exposure to the cold Well, I, if you saw those pictures, I've got this balaclava over my face, and I don't know what's coming up. I think, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, well, this is a good one. Uh, I'd mark my di sometimes, that's about a mile and a half from the station. It was actually minus 100 that day, but it was minus 98 when I left the station. It was not about a mile and a half, and I thought it was funny to write that on a, on a thing. Um, I always had two balaclavas cover my face, and what I would do is as soon as I got out, I'd breathe. <sighs> A lot like scuba, it felt like scuba. You're breathing, and the reason I do it is the vapor would freeze up the mask and make an ice block, and that would that created kind of a space, uh, a warmth. So the ice actually kept my face warm. Um, I didn't have to wear eye protection. I'm out in minus 100, but that little bit of void, whatever it was, was enough where I can, you know, didn't lose my eyes, and I didn't. I wouldn't really want to go out. Well, I'll kind of explain later. We'll have it enough. I'll show you something. Um, I wouldn't want to go out and take a big deep gulp of minus 100. You'd feel that, and that could damage. Next, please. So I got out. Okay, that's my sign-up board. Now, see, the thing was, when I was when I would go out, I had I was I am the leader of the um, the leader of the incident response team, uh, the emergency response team. So I had to have them kind of know where I was, and uh, so I made that board up, and then where they could see um, from that board, they had instructions to uh, uh, where I was and um, what to do if they couldn't find me. Uh, very easy process there. And then the bottom right, I kept track of my miles. Okay, next. This is oh, almost done. This was the day I hit 4,000 miles outside. Now, this was a few miles a day. I never missed a day. In the time I was there, I never missed a day. As a leader, I'm sending people out. They might have to go to their satellite place. They have to go, I need to go out. I need to go out and see. Because I could be the one that could call the condition and say it was too bad to go out. I never did. I never declared it. What I said to the crew was, we got to give them training in, cold, in the travel, darkness, and I always volunteered. I'd go with them if they ever needed me to go with them. Um, it, was not, um, uh, it was not pleasant sometimes, and to not miss a day in those years is, a, is, is fairly remarkable. Uh, uh, some people say things about records. I don't give a damn about records. I hate it. Um, there's enough, uh, enough scoundrels that, that want to claim some of these ridiculous little uh, me, me, look at me. Uh, self-promotional first, the first to ski here, the first to ski there. They leave out the fact that they've got a rescue aircraft and they're on satellite phones and they've got sponsors and all this stuff. I hate that shit. Um, just hate it. Can't tell probably from that, from that. But the point is, is that I was out there alone, just a few miles from the station, but I needed them to check. So I didn't miss a day and, ended, and I ended up around 4,300 miles outside, which if nothing else, what it is, it gave me an appreciation for cold weather, probably more than most anyone maybe. Next. Okay, real cool, it's dark. Next, that's what I saw. Next, this is what I was gonna show you. Frozen up, that's about minus 100. So there's a block of ice and my eyes are there. Looks like that, did you see a Walking Dead show? Look kind of. <laughs> Next, that's about minus 90. I like that one because you can see my exhal exhalation. Next, it's very important, I'm gonna do this quickly because it was important. When I got to the pole, this year, uh, came back after just a couple weeks off. There's this big cross in my office, big cross in my office, and uh, big wooden cross. And my boss and my boss said, Wayne, the, these Italians brought it on the tourist aircraft, and they said, can we plant it at the South Pole at a certain time on Easter, and they're going to do a simultaneous thing at the North Pole at the same time? And that cross and the, there was a rosary, and the rosary was blessed by the Pope, so it was a big deal. So, you know, great Papa in Rome kissed and did whatever he did with that rosary, and then I got this big cross. Now, the U.S. Antarctica program is pretty secular. They don't, you know, it's not a, you know, so I was kind of surprised they wanted me to do it, but, you know, uh, they didn't ask me to do it. My boss just said, these guys want these Italians. So I debated, what the hell do I do? You know, what do I do? I'm not a Catholic, but it uh, didn't matter. On Easter, I got to thinking about it. 
And I thought the only thing right to do was to just do just that. So on Easter Sunday, next, I carried that cross and I planted it at the South Pole during the midst of this COVID crisis with that beautiful cross that says so much about Christ and uh, people was planted at the South Pole. The uh, North Pole thing never happened because of the COVID. They didn't simultaneously do it, but I did my part. Next, I hope to make up for a couple of things in life by that. Fact. <laughs> this is important. I'll go quickly. Some of you saw this from the 17th. We are the, we are the emergency response team. We are it. There's no one coming for us. That's it. The guys in 17 wanted to do a calendar for 2018. <laughs> And I thought, shit, this is great, great professionalism. I, you know, this what, is the- What kind of calendar? Well, um, there's the cover, they showed me that, and then, uh, then I got to see the calendar. Next. All right. <laughs> Looking very sultry. I said, uh, Miss January, yeah, that's Adam, yeah. Real nice. Uh, next. All right, a little shy, a little shy stuff going on there with JP. Um, and then, of course, the back cover, next. Yeah, nothing. So these guys, um, I oiled up, too, is really the cool thing. Um, but all kidding aside, next, they took this stuff really seriously. These guys drilled and were, uh, all, my, all three of my crews had fantastic emergency response. Um, and they drilled and drilled and drilled. And we could handle, by, especially the last two, especially the last two years, could handle any kind of thing that we could face at the South Pole. I was very proud of them. Next, this is technical rescue. Like what we would do if someone's outside and they're in you know terrible situation, how we would be able to move them. Next. Sun comes up eventually. Next. Beautiful shot Danny Hampton did. Danny Hampton, a steward that did the video. Next. That's me. I was taken after a seven mile walk in minus 104. Next. Doesn't mean because the sun comes up, it warms up. It doesn't for quite a while. A lot of ice from the winter that you start to see when the sun comes up. Next. We've got to get the skiway ready for the aircraft to come. Next. Ugh. My 2020, the millennium crew, millennial crew wanted to do a social undistancing party. And I broke a little bit of my normal aura, whatever you want to call it, to do this. Next. They were all over each other. You know, social undistancing. And I'm in the bottom of that pile. Next. They're great folks. What do we do? Take the flags down. Next. These are flags that have been at the ceremonial pole for a year. That's a 17, I took the Norwegian flag down. Next. So wait, not to interrupt yeah. again, but real quick, isn't there a carpet that has the mustache adorned? There in is, the, and I took it out of this. There, the, the crew is somehow fascinated with my, with my mustache, and I took it out, but there was a, um, it was actually in several places in the station. They had a big banner. They had, a, uh, they had someone emblazoned a mustache on the floor of the galley, which is still there. Um, there was a really funny one where they did, uh, the, who knows, the Game of Thrones? They made this flyer, had this, the mustache, and it said, House White, um, <laughs> King of Ice South, Lord of Night Long. <laughs> now, I got to say, my vanity, I love that shit, you know? I mean, <laughs> God damn that tombstone stuff. I'll write it down. Tombstone. King of Ice South, Lord of Night Long. Anyway, so the mustache seemed to, for whatever reason, it got some attention, and that was, that was cool. Uh, but, and so, um, uh, and if you noticed on that picture of the of the guy, the firefighters, there's a little mustache. There's a picture there of the mustache that they were trying to grow. I say trying to grow in that corner. All right, next. Okay, so the aircraft comes in. That's uh, the C-130. Um, next. That's a Basler. This year we didn't even have C-130. So the, the, the arriving group and we left on these little Baslers. Next. So this is important. As a, as a winner over, you receive the Antarctic Service Medal. Um, the Antarctic Service Medal uh, is really cool. Um, and as a winter over, meaning you spent the entire winter at the South Pole, you get a little clasp that goes on the ribbon part. Uh, it starts with the first winter is uh, bronze, second winter is, uh, is uh, gold, and the third winter is silver. And then after that, it, you don't get another one. Silver is the highest. So a uh, little statistic, in 64 years of the South Pole Station, um, only, besides myself, only two other winter managers ever came back for a second winter. Only two in 64 years. There's a reason for that. It's not an easy job. And there's some sad stories, quite frankly, of what happened during those years. Hell, I liked it. I came back for a third. So I'm the only one in history that, you know, winter manager did three winters, which, uh, you know, again, I'm not into the record shit. It doesn't matter to me. But 
it means I do have a, um, that is a distinction, and I do treasure that, that medal. Next. So, so nobody else has the silver class. They do, but they don't have it for being in that position, you know, in that, as, a, as the winter manager. Like I say, only two others did two winters where they would have gotten the, where they would have gotten the gold, and no one ever did the silver. And again, it's no big deal, but it's, um, it meant something to me. Next. Okay. We fly away. Bye, South Pole. Next. From. Real quickly, because I do want to show a little short video, and I want, this is important. You guys will, it'll be worth the wait. It's only a couple minutes long, but it, you'll, it'll, it's a good way to end on. From, that was Amundsen's ship, the From. Um, the flag that I took my first winter, next, was a Norwegian flag. I'm on board the From. That's in Oslo, Norway, with our crew signed Norwegian flag, along with a patch. We have a patch just like a, our crew has a patch just like a, a space mission patch for that 2017 crew, and it's signed by the entire crew. And I took the crew with me, in essence, to the Fram in Oslo, Norway. Next. For my 2019 year, that's a Scott's ship Discovery, which is up there in um, Dundee, Scotland. Has anybody seen it? Dundee, Scotland. Uh, next. For that, I took, that year I took the British flag, same thing, crew patch, signed, took it to the, uh, took it to the, uh, the ship, and got photos taken. Um, uh, I got an American flag for the last year, and I'm, we don't have a famous ship like that, so I'm gonna, there's, we have famous aircraft, so I'm working that out, but the COVID thing kind of screwed that up. Um, okay, now I'm gonna, this is the end, except I, I need to do this last video, and it is important, and you'll understand why. Okay, so go to the next slide. Look at that. All right, so that's the end of the slide presentation. But can I get you to queue up that, that video, the 2.0, please. And you'll say you've seen this before, but it includes the outtakes. And I'll explain what really happened. We're ready, what, Wayne? Go ahead. Give me the word. All right, here we go. Greetings from the South Pole. I'm Wayne White, the winter manager at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Folks, did you know Antarctica is actually classified as a desert? It's the highest, driest, coldest place on the planet. But make no mistake, I'm the captain of a ship. A ship that sits on nearly two miles of ice. This two miles of ice is moving. It's moving that way at around 33 feet per year. In thousands of years, this ice that I'm standing on will find its way to the sea and then into our beautiful southern oceans. That's why it's important that we monitor the health of this Antarctic ice cap, as it will have an effect on the health of our ocean and its levels. So what do we do here? First of all, we survive. We survive in one of the most inhospitable environments on the planet. The current air temperature is minus 80 something with a wind chill making it around minus 130. That doesn't keep us inside. Personally, over the last three winters I've been here, I've walked 3,500 miles outside and should hit my goal of 4,000 miles uh, by the time I leave in November. But what else do we do here? Most importantly, we do some very cool science. Let me show you a little bit of that. First, we have our ice cube laboratory. This is a neutrino telescope. Imagine a cubic kilometer of ice with over 5,400 embedded detectors. These detectors detect neutrinos coming in from nuclear forces in stars and black holes. Then we have the South Pole Telescope. This is a 10 meter microwave dish which detects the echo of the Big Bang and birth of the universe. Next, we have our MAPO. This hosts the bicep array, which also looks at cosmic microwave background and is looking for evidence of inflation right after the Big Bang. Then we have our arrow. This is a part of a global network that monitors gases in the Earth's atmosphere oh, like to this. track and model human impacts. For World Oceans Week, here at the South Pole, I'm Wayne White. Okay, folks, here's the deal, that looked really nice. I thought I could do that in one take. I thought I could do that in one take as I had done the previous minute at the mic. It turned out I couldn't do it in one take. So this is the kind of behind the scenes of what happened, what Danny Hampton and I actually face to put that together. Go with the synth, synth soundtrack to fade out. Here we go. Yeah. Son of a bitch, yeah. Okay. See, you can check your light too this way. 
Testing, testing. One, two, three. Wow. Yow. Ah, shit. <laughs> hey, toward the Weddell Sea. The ice I'm standing on. Lost the camera. Ah. <laughs> Just in case, I'd rather freeze for a purpose. Yeah. Oh, I should have put some different pants on. <laughs> Before the end of this winter, yeah, okay. <laughs> in my three winters here, I've walked over 3,500 miles so far, and I'm on track to hit 4,000 miles, walking every day during those, oh well, forget about that. <laughs> All right, uh, well, let's regroup a little bit. Can we do that? Yeah. Folks, this, Da, da, da. Okay, take it again. <laughs> I'm Wayne White. The winter, the winter, the, the freezing winter. <laughs> All right, one more time. Greetings from the South Pole. I'm Wayne White. The winter, the winter. <laughs> They're going to do this one more time. Whew. That is cold. <laughs> right now, it's a Minus 82 Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's regroup a little bit inside. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> Shit. All right. About the same spot. What's it called? World Oceans Week? I think it's World. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For World Oceans Week. Yes, yeah, please do this again. For world, one more time, it's World Oceans. For World Oceans Week, here at the South Pole, I'm Wayne White. Cut. <laughs> I think we got it, Danny. I sure shit don't want to do too much more of this. <laughs> All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that. I know I went a little long, went long, but hope it was worth your time. No, th thank you so much, Wayne. So I think I'm, I'm assuming we're going to have some questions from the audience and probably some questions from the chat. But before we get into that, I have a question. Sure. And because I'm sitting in the chair, yeah, yeah, I get you could go know, first. Special yeah. privilege. <laughs> um, so you obviously have a huge connection to the historical uh, precedence of exploring the South Pole, being down there, and you made an interesting comment about. You know, your, your big quote, Herman Melville from uh, uh, Moby Dick. And I haven't read the book in a long time, but yeah. I seem to remember a scene that stood out to me, and I, I could be totally wrong. But there is a scene where Ishmael almost breaks through to Captain Ahab, where it's almost like you could give up this hunt. You don't have to hunt this white whale anymore. You could just go home, and it'll all be fine. And Ahab is, I believe, in tears in the scene and expresses that he can't give it up, that he's so obsessed at this point that he's almost cursed to chase this white whale forever. And so I guess this is in some ways kind of a two-part question, if that scene is accurately. I think it was Starbuck that did that. Fair enough, but there is a scene where Ahab yeah, is. is almost yeah, yeah. willing to give up the chase. Yeah. Having done three winners over, which it sounds like is, is a record, nobody's done three winners well, over. Well, let me, let me be clear about one thing. I'm sorry I get it up because there's something I should have said. My, the reason I don't tout the three winners, the record for winners at the South Pole is around 15. And that was done by science personnel. And not to take anything away, it's different what they do. They come in and they do their thing and all that. Still, I know both guys. One guy's at 15 and one is 14. Um, uh, it's just a different situation. But as a leader, they don't come back. So back to fair, fair enough. So I guess the question is, is twofold. One, was there part of you returning for your third winner that felt this kind of sadistic pull to the place, where maybe part of you wanted to walk away from it and say, look, I've been there twice already. I don't need to do it a third time, but felt compelled almost by obsession to do it. And then the second part, and I hope you know, within reason you can be honest about this, because I believe this is the Adventurers Club sure, where sure we're honest about honest. these things. Having such a reverence for the history of the place and the courage and the brutality that that the historical figures endured to explore it, being faced with an unprecedented event like the COVID pandemic, was there part of you that almost relished the contingency plan to have to walk your way out? 
to face those elements in person the way that your historical idols face them? I think those are really excellent questions. I, I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of that. Um, as far as my own obsession, I am certainly obsessed. I'm on those iron rails doing what I'm doing, whether it was at the South Pole or whether it was in, New, in expeditions in New Guinea. This thing is, uh, I'm real harsh on, modern, on the modern world, on some of the books that come out, some of the articles I read, the, the damned um, uh, the, uh, reality TV, not with where I've been, and I see this embellished bullshit, and the, 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 uh, and the polls rife with it, with everybody trying to do a first, it'll be a pogo stick next, first a pogo stick backwards. That house I live in, that's not just a house, it's a goddamn monument. It's a monument to these people. That ring Melissa's wearing, that's Henry Morton Stanley's ring. You know what he did? If you don't, research it. There's never been a tougher guy than that guy crossing the Congo like he did. My obsession, quite frankly, is honoring and, and, and acknowledging what they did, and so it puts me in a weird situation where the current, what's going on currently to me is almost laughable at times. Um, so, so, but I do have an obsession to try hard and to push, to push harder. And, um, but it's tempered with the fact that that crew came first, that as a leader, and that's something I learned over those 25 years, and that's something I learned on my own expeditions in New Guinea, where because of me, my crew, I took Highlanders out of, out of the Highlands down into the swamps and they got malaria. I caused them to get malaria. My will, my vanity, to do this expedition to get from the interior to the coast, which I don't know anyone's done that. I'm not, write, didn't write a book about it. Um, but uh, caused that to happen. Uh, lessons learned. As a leader, you have to make some unpleasant decisions. I didn't have to do that. But I do have an obsession. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's unhealthy or not. I don't know. It's just what I am. It's just kind of what I am, whether that is unhealthy. Uh, maybe some could find it that way. I don't know. It's just I'm on those iron rails. And um, I try, though, to make sure that I don't forget what Ahab did forget and never knew, or maybe he lost sight of. You don't need to kill that whale. You need to take care of that crew. That's the first part. The second part was about the, about the... The, the question was is, is whether at some point in some dark recesses of your mind, the prospect of having to walk your way out. Oh, the yeah, yeah. Of losing support yeah. in terms of feeling the, the yeah, historical yeah. connection to those men that endured yeah. that. If there was some party that relished that opportunity. Here's the thing. I mean, quite frankly, you know, I walk in these guys' shadow. My house, with the things that are in there, I'm in these great men's shadow. Uh, you know, like I say, that's why I rail against some of this stuff now, the me, me, look at me, um, writing books, doing the things people do that to me are tourist things for the most part. Uh, because I know what that guy did, shot himself, or shot him his way across Africa, too bad he had to do that, or a David Livingstone that was out in the jungle doing the things that he did and to, to, to help, to try to help in the slave trade. I knew what these great men did. And when I'm in that house, I'm in their shadow. So I look at things, I look at things like, I'll never do the kind of things that they did. That doesn't mean I can't have some adventures, and that doesn't mean that I'm down on, you know, guys here that whatever adventures are. We all have different views of what they are. Would I love the ultimate adventure? Would I have loved to have walked to the coast? Yeah, except for the fact that if we had got to that point, my wife would probably be dead. And it would have been, because it would have been so bad before someone couldn't come get the process, it would have been so bad that some new virus, with a new mutation was raging that took everybody out, and then what are we doing? So the world as I knew it would be dead. So it would be one of the epic journeys that no one would ever know about, making it to the coast. Yeah, a little bit wanted to do it, but not to, the, not to, to, to you know, world ending. I still have some ideas for some things that I want to do, and we'll see how it, how it goes. I love to, I measure myself against those greats. Um, I do. Um, uh, I think you need to do that. Keep, you know, there's, there's, that's what I look at, not you know, some contemporary. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. If we have a mic going around, we'll yeah. start. And I'm sure we also have some questions from the chat. Sure, I'm sorry. But Keep let's start with from the audience, whoever's got the mic. I'll just speak up. So uh, the foundation, why doesn't it melt and the building sink? If yeah. It's built on ice? So re real quick, just to restate, mm -hmm. the foundation of the building, why doesn't it melt and just sink into the ice year after year? It kind of does. 
And that's, and I didn't really point it out because I was trying to hurry, but that's how we sort of lost the first, we get about a, a foot of new ice every year there. About a foot of new ice comes in. And what happens is it sort of buries the building and maybe it sinks somewhat. That, that's why we lost the first, the first old pole. That's why the dome, by the time it was done, that once sat on top of the ice, was under the ice. By the time it was done, you had to drive down to it. And finally, they, that was it. So that elevated station sits on pedestals, big pedestals, and it's aerodynamically facing into the prevailing wind. So you have prevailing wind that kind of scours, and it can be raised. It can actually be raised. So it will get more use out of the elevated station than those other stations. Does that answer that? Because it would. It would sink and be gone. OK, what else? Yes, let's see. Wait, real quick. Andy, any, any questions from the chat? Yes, thank you so much for joining folks uh, in the chat. First question is, uh, in regards to your running attire, can you walk us through how you, um, how you trade off warmth for mobility yeah. down there? My, you know, my running attire was quite primitive except for my shoes. I had these really cool modern shoes with spikes, kind of plastic spikes, and they, had a, they were made by a French company. They had a zipper that zipped up over the laces. But my running attire was cotton. It was basically cotton and thermal type stuff. I didn't have the hi-fi cool jackets and things for running. And I don't know how many of those miles, some of it was running. Um, I uh, am a runner. I, I started logging in my miles in 1981, every day that I ran. And I've logged in about 45,000 miles um, in those years. I once went for about 12 years without missing a day. And then I thought it became a little ridiculous. And I was almost looking for an excuse. And I found one in Africa that was, became a problem. But so I missed a day. But um, you know that, that maybe that was obsessive. But um, so, so my running attire was really, and think about this though. Like I mentioned, in the summer, I could be running. It might only be like 20 below or something like that, or you know, 30 below or, or something, or, or 10. And, uh, hell, at one winter, the last winter, it was at 1.9 above Fahrenheit. That was almost a record. So you're just dealing with like you're running in the cold in the Midwest for the most part. It was my running attire was pretty darn simple. Okay, I think that's a good question. All right, next question we'll take from the audience. I see you back there. Yes, sir. Yeah, as a, as a kid in the 1950s, my impression of the polar exploration was always, part of it was always like focused on frostbite. So what, how was that a problem, you know, with the, yeah. the three years? You know, I'm sure you had really good ways to, to prevent it. Or yeah. So, so the question to restate it was the prevalence of frostbite amongst your crews over three years. Is how much was that a factor, and what did you, what plans did you have to mitigate that? Yeah, we did. The first thing was training, training on the cold weather. And I have a presentation I did after my set first winter because then I gained so much knowledge where I would do the training, and um, to discuss how to dress, how to be careful, and all this stuff. And yet we did have crew members with frostbite. We had some crew members came in with their face. Uh, that it was frostbit. Um, we had one guy with feet one time. He didn't lose toes or anything, but he was out too long and that happened. I would have cases where stuff would burn. Uh, you, I call it a burn. There's a, one of the photos you can't see. You see it kind of close up. I'm wearing, I, I learned to wear this Band-Aid thing on my nose right here. Uh, it's some reason that would just, pr that would keep this bridge because it was burning and it was getting, to, it feels kind of funny to this day now. I think something's missing, but um, <laughs> from earlier trips, but I would, I, anyway, I would, uh, I would, get, I would get it around the eyes and things and sometimes things like that. I also know from doing things outside where I had to take my gloves off, um, you know they talk about going to sleep, freezing, going, God it hurt. When I was out and I had to take my gloves off to do certain things, um, the pain was excruciating and it would take me several minutes to get the circulation back. So you know we got the right clothes, the training and then you're careful, but we had frostbite. I looked at it as kind of a, a badge of someone that screwed up. And I, if it was me, I'd be I'd mortified that they'd see something on my face or something. Man, I screwed up. Yes, sir. Uh, after you return, what is your contact? Hey, real, real quick, Pierre, wait, wait for the mic. We got the mic now. Thank you. Um, after you returned, what is your contact with the team members you were down there? Yeah, what, the 2020 group actually has their own Facebook page. And I, I was actually going to have a team member here tonight for my 2017 crew. And he couldn't make, he got sick at the last minute. Said it wasn't any problem. He said he couldn't taste. And um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's what he said. And he says, OK, maybe you should stay home. <laughs> but uh, no, we, it's a tight group, let me tell you. I didn't bring it. I forgot to bring that, my ring. But I actually have a ring that has my number. We have numbers. My number is 1522. 
The 1,600 people, approximately 1,600 people, have wintered at the South Pole. Five, over 5,000 have climbed Mount Everest. It's a very exclusive group, and we stay in contact. There's actually a database that has us all listed in there, and a number of winters and things that we've done. It's a tight group. Well, I, I hate to undercut that, but there's yeah. even fewer members of the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so there we go. There so, we go. So real quick, we're going to go, I think, another question from the chat. Andy? Yeah. Okay. I've okay. heard that uh, the polls that the common colds don't exist. Once you get together and share all your bacteria and viruses and things like that, uh, does anybody come down with a cold during the time that you're down there? That is a fantastic question. No one's ever asked me. And the fact is, we have what we call the crud. Flying in there, usually after, after going through uh, um, all that long trip from Colorado down to the pole and all this, you'll, every, almost every time I was sick. And, and it's disgusting. It's like a, a flu, you know, sore throat and all that. But once you've been through it, we don't get sick in the winter. We might have other ailments, you know, I want to say food borne because I don't want to say anything about my galley staff. But a few times we had some cleansing opportunities due to whatever the hell. Um, so we, we don't get sick during the winter. Like we don't get colds. It stops. It's really cool. Yes, sir. Great. For the average crew member, what's the toughest part of wintering over? I think it's, it's, it's funny enough, it's interesting. I talk about the young guys. When I interviewed them, one thing where I could see their face just fall was when I explained about the lack of connectivity and slow internet speed and no phones. That would be like to them, because these young folks, they live on them, right? They live on those phones. You got up there on all the time, walk around, they don't even look. I was, saw two people on a date once. They're on a date. They're sitting across the table. And I was at a bar, I was at a bar. I had a scotch, so I was pretty talkative. But uh, um, they're sitting, and they're both on this little thing. And she's looking over. It's a nice young couple. And I said, What are you doing? And they said, Well, we're on our first date. It's like, What are you doing? But then I found out later, you're supposed to, like, you, you, if it's not going well, you then tell someone. My apartment's flooding, and then you get to leave, whatever. So there's the strategy. But the point is, uh, I think it's, I'm going to say that the lack of technology, and also it's missing family members. It's got to be missing family members, the people that aren't used to that, and they're away from home for that length of time, and they can't do anything. And the pet dies, a pet. You know, I learned a lot overseas in my other assignments about the importance of pets and what happens when a pet dies. Um, to, for someone, it's a, it's a hell of a, it can be a hell of an experience. It, it's right up there with losing a family member. So I think lack of contact with family and the things that can occur at home, and then the technology gets a lot of people. They don't like it. So, so real quick, Wayne, I guess I'm, I'm the, uh, the communicator for the chat. Yeah. Um, but one of the questions from the chat is, what's the most desirable position to be on on the team in terms of uh, maybe what is the position that might be the most high demand that people wouldn't even think of? Well, interestingly enough, something like a plumber. You know, everybody's thinking we're out there looking through telescopes. Well, the science folks are the science folks. They work for the educational, uh, you know, institutions and things. But the fact is we're keeping the station open, and I'll take a plumber any day. Or, a, or a, a, when we have, like, a carpenter. He's not a carpenter. He can do anything. He can, a carpenter can fix the elevator and can do all kinds of things. Um, the, main, the power plant, oh, my God, I bow to those guys. I want the best when it comes to uh, power plant people. They're keeping us alive. They're keeping those power plants up and operational. So those trade things. But we get someone down there like Danny who did those videos. He was doing dishes, uh, pots and pans. And it was hard, hard work. I wouldn't say that's coveted. People don't come back for that job. But um, I think the trades, uh, IT stuff, people that are good with IT, um, it's, uh, but for, you know, we're, we're looking for people that can do multiple things that are the best at what they can do. And, and a quick, quick story about that, quick, because it's important. When I'm interviewing people, I learned this. My boss taught me this. I didn't believe it. I do now. He said this. He said, the people that are most successful are the people that love what they do, like their craft or something. See, we get all these people that want to sit in the interview process, and I love Antarctica. I read all about Ernest Shackleton. I love all. I love this. I love. I want to see a. Well, if they see, say they want to see a polar bear, that's a done deal. They're done. <laughs> but um, and it's been done. But the fact is, is they love Antarctica, and they think that's going to catch our attention. Not at all. I want to because those people. What happens once they go get there and they get the little hero shot out the pole marker? They did it. They're at the South Pole. Now they got a year. And they've got that, they're there. And there's no wildlife, there's nothing at the pole, there's nothing but desolation, darkness, and cold. But if someone loves what they do, IT, cooking, I mean, we have some chefs that were world class, 
they'll be most successful. So, and it's a good point. Any chefs or plumbers oh, or electricians yeah. might Anybody be looking. Yeah, electricians. That's uh, an opportunity for you. Yeah, yeah. Are there, are there any other questions from the, the room? Yeah. yeah. How did you find a custom Siberian wolfskin tailor? Was that just in the phone book, or? No, I, 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 I just, I'm not going to go through the process. Um, I don't want anybody doing it. That's but I, I, I did. I found out. I found a, a, a furrier in Russia that made not those. And then I said, "Can you make this to my specifications?" And they were able to do it. That's not. It wasn't an off-the-shelf thing. And they. They didn't understand why anyone would want that. They'd think I want this thing to wear up at Aspen or Vail, you know, this thing with buttons and cool. I said, no, this is, and I showed a picture of Roll Amundsen in front that he took, um, that, uh, that he had taken of him wearing wolf skins. And I said, this is the cut, this is what I want, Inuit design, and it's got to be durable. But that's, that's what I did. I had a company that doesn't normally make that kind of stuff make one for me. So it's a one of a kind. Were you in person or was this online? Or? Online, I had to take measurements and stuff. Online, I don't think I did anything by phone. But I had to do measurements of things to get it right, and it arrived, and it's perfect. So, quick, quick follow-on question: Is there yeah. any scenario where you could imagine wearing the Gore-Tex issued gear, or do you fully believe in those traditional? Well, I wore like if you look at that military ECW, I, I just didn't go for the big red the thing that they issue everybody. I wore that military thing, that that thing a lot, and it was just fine. I'm not against Gore-Tex and stuff. In fact, if I was on a you know a real expedition doing some stuff, I'd probably go with the modern when I could, just because of ease of things. The fur gets wet or something, it could get wet. I'm not against technology. I just appreciate some of the stuff in the past. Okay. So Wayne, if I remember before, you've talked about each crew had a motto, or each year you had yeah. a crew motto. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, I tell you, I tried to. I mean, tried the first year on our it was on our poll marker. It said, "By endurance we conquer." That's Shackleton. That was Shackleton's phrase. The next year was something that I did that I tried to spend to the crew. It wasn't received as well, but I, I would get them together for a little pre-winter discussion. And I came down hard explaining what my expectations were. And my expectations were, and I talked about Amundsen's expedition and what he did in 1911 with superb planning. And, and going from the Bay of Wales, up blasting up the Axel Heiberg uh, Glacier, and to the pole, and what I expected the people, and that was that we would return whole and unharmed, that we would return the station in better shape than, than we got it in, that we would not have any big HR type issues, and that we would come together as a crew. And I used that, I said, Amundsen, his commitment, his commitment, what he did back then when he, when he uh, uh, did his trip, he committed to something, and he committed to a terrible thing. He ate the dogs. The dogs worked out, they were, the dogs worked into the food plant. He ate these dogs. If you read his diaries, he didn't want to eat the dogs. They knew the dogs, they knew the dogs' names. Now remember, these are dogs, they're almost like wolves. They're kind of wild, these Greenland dogs, but they were still their dogs, they had names. And he's killing these dogs and eating them. He committed to that. It was a big enough deal to commit to that, to do this thing. And I told my crew, you will commit, you will commit. You will eat the dogs, metaphorically speaking. That's what I told my second crew. But also literally, if need be. Well, we had no dogs. But the thing was, was um, uh, it was received somewhat lukewarmly, I think, because if they do a Facebook post that they ate the dogs, you know. But it's on the pole marker. It's on that pole marker for eternity. We ate the dogs. And then I tried to spin for the last one. I tried to spin the iron way that comes from the end of that. But my crew, they weren't the iron way. It was different. I was. I mean, I, I lived that, but they weren't. They were different. A good, great group of people, but I can't force that on them. But that's what I, what I wanted. So, so re another question from the yeah. chat that I'm kind of interpreting my own way. Yeah. But if you could compare yourself to one of the great oh. South Pole captains, and I'm assuming here we're thinking of Amundsen, Shackleton, and Scott, who yes. were in their own ways very different in terms of mentality and, and goals, who do you feel the greatest kinship with? in terms of the challenges they faced and what you thought you brought to the table? I think it'd probably be a mix. It'd probably be a mix of Shackleton and, and Amundsen. I, 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 I um, appreciated Shackleton's care for his crew, but I also appreciated Amundsen's meticulous planning because that's what it's all about, that meticulous planning, and that's but, what but I Amundsen, believe in. Not, wasn't he a bit of a daredevil? I mean, didn't he take a North Pole plan and then very quickly uh, adapt he, to a South Pole if plan? If you read what he did, yes, but he did it 
he did it, um, he, he took a risk, he took a risk finding an axle hybrid glacier, whether it was there or not, but those guys were a hardened bunch, much harder than Scott's, much harder than Shackleton's, much better provisioned, much more experienced. And that's what I wanted, and I told my crews that, and I mentioned that when I hired, I didn't hire just a crew member to do a normal winter, I hired a crew member that if the station broke in half, if the dam, I tried to hire, if the station, the ice shifted, I wanted the person that could deal with that. So that's what I was looking for in a crew member. And, and thank God, that never happened. But, um, you know, I can't compare myself. Those are great men. I'm not. All right, let's take one more question from the audience and then one more question from the chat. Anybody else from the audience have a question? All the way in the back. In hiring your crew, did you take demographics into con uh, consideration, like age, background, gender, whatever it may be, in trying to make a... Not only the person was qualified, but the mix would also work well for you. Well, quite frankly, quite fr that's a really great question. And quite frankly, um, I, I, I didn't. We don't. And of course, with hiring procedures now, you know, you've got rules on hiring and such. But let me tell you what I did do. The first crew, I kind of just fell in with them, hired as best I could. And there's nothing more excruciating than me hiring that first crew where I sat in a room in Denver. And I've got a crew member looking across the table at me. And he says, myself in the panel. And he says, what does minus 100 feel like? And I'd never been there, and I'd never felt it. And it was excruciating. And I could talk about where I'd been around the world and what I'd done, but it was lame compared to that I couldn't. Second year, I was ready. I was ready. And what I wanted was, it wasn't demographics, I wanted the most experienced. And that 2019 crew was the most experienced crew probably in South Pole history. I was able to attract over 50 around 50% that had previously wintered. That's a staggering statistic. 50% of our crew had previously wintered and wanted to come back. 70% had previous Antarctic experience, maybe at summer at Pole, maybe Palmer, maybe McMurdo. So we had 70% that had Antarctic experience prior. That's what I wanted. They ate the dogs, and that's what I wanted. And my third crew, I just got the crew, and they were phenomenal. And I have to say, because I, you know, I made some fun and said stuff about millennials, but the fact of the matter is that they had a kindness to them, too, which was really necessary that last year. They were kind to each other. And um, yeah, they wanted to play hide and seek in the station, and they had other, you know, I don't know why they want to watch movies for eight-year-olds, but the fact is, they were a kind crew. And they were technologically very savvy, and I love the people. I love the folks. OK, that's right. All right, so, so the last couple questions we have, yeah. one is from the chat, and okay. one I'm going to kind of tag team on to. Um, but the question is, uh, what's, so this is a very unfair tag on. But mm. the, the question from the chat is, what is the favorite artifact you have from your house? But I would like to tag on, if you can say, which I'm guessing you can. Yeah. What is your favorite Antarctic winter over crew? Ooh. If you were to pick from Ooh. the three. Yeah, OK. Um, first off, favorite artifact. I'm a big fan. I mean, that endurance piece means a lot. But I'm a big fan of Dr. David Livingstone and what he did in Africa to suppress the slave trade. When David Livingston died, his heart was buried um, on Uiji. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, in Central Africa. He's out there with his loyal followers who carried him almost 1,000 miles to the coast. They, they eviscerated him. They buried his heart under a tree. And they put him in kind of a sailcloth. And there was a, a bow, bow of a tree thing that they held, you can imagine, with the one in front. And Dr. Livingston wrapped up in the sailcloth kind of stuff. And they carried his body all the way across to Africa uh, to the coast of Zanzibar. And then his body was taken by a British ship. And he was then buried. In, in, at Westminster Abbey. One of the things that I have is a cross section of that bow that carried Dr. David Livingstone's body with silver around it that says Dr. David Livingstone, Zanzibar, 1874. That is a treasure. That was with that great man across Africa with, carried by these incredible people that did that. I would, if I'd have to say, I've had to my wife, as we talked once about who to grab in a fire. I'm not there. I'd sit in her first, I'd grab her first, and then, and then cats. Cats come over anything else. But I'd want to try to grab the bow of that tree, also the piece of wood that was from the tree that his heart was buried under. And then if you got time, it's not burning too badly. <laughs> Polar room, get the, yeah. Well, if I'm not there, so. But save yourself. For God's sake, save yourself. Don't, <laughs> I don't want her, she ran back in to get the Shackleton piece of wood. Oh, God, does that answer that? 
And the last one, but my favorite crew, oh, I'll never answer that. I never. I, I figured as much. Yeah. They were so, all different. They were all different. They're all wonderful people. So real quick, Wayne, you have more experience, I think, than anybody at the South Pole in terms of wintering over. Uh, 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 is in my position. In my position. Let's qualify it. I don't, I don't like I said, I don't like silly records. But I, uh, in my position, I do. And, um, uh, and I was outside a lot. And so that, that, you know, there's a distinction to that, which, again, I don't like. I don't like numbers and firsts and this and that, but it meant I was outside in some really terrible conditions a lot. And that, when you're out there alone and you're walking and you're in that place and you're thinking there's nothing quite like it. And that's why I try to capture in this book that stuff, you know, the, the psychological. And my being alone, I was alone on those crews and I loved them all that they, they were my crew. They were my crew. Well, we, we appreciate humility. We appreciate it, even though you don't want to hawk it, your book that's coming out, yeah. Cold. Yeah. <laughs> so did, if, if you have a chance to pick it up, please do. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, <laughs> this, this is a humble club. You know, we've, yeah. we've often talked that you have to be careful about what you talk about here because if you say you go up some river and take a left, there's going to be someone in the audience who says, no, actually, you take I, I a gotta, right. I, I'm going to interrupt you because you non-club members or even club members, on my first visit to the club, I was, I was talking about a, a time I was in Afghanistan, and I was talking about flying, flying, in a Blackhawk and we were going over this place and I was explaining what it looked like and I said it looked like the surface of Mars and the club member said well exactly where on Mars so, <laughs> so that was a huge attraction to this club <laughs> exactly there's always someone in the audience who's been there and done yeah, that I know yeah. we have some Antarctic people and Arctic veterans in the club um, yeah. tonight so Wayne thank you for sharing your story as oh, we usually do we're gonna we're gonna kind of wind out our, our YouTube live stream and then I'm going to present you with a plaque of appreciation. Oh, boy. Oh. So I'd ask you all to stay seated. And, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you, Wayne, for coming to share your story with us. We always appreciate you as a member. It's always great to see you here in L.A. when you're able to make it out. And thank uh, you for sharing your stories of adventure with us from down south. Alex, really thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. And, and please, oh, yeah. for, for those of you at home that are watching along, please subscribe. Turn on the notification bell. It supports us. It supports the club. It supports our mission of sharing stories from off the beaten path. And we'll be here next week with another fantastic tale um, from who knows where. Yeah, Every week something different. So thank you, Wayne. And thank you to those who are watching at home and here in the audience tonight. Thank you. All right. Good right. go. So Wayne, I didn't want to ask you this on camera, but the big question...